So good morning again, everyone. Uh, we are here in the National Aviation University in Kiev, and uh, we're glad, glad that all are connected well, most of us. Somebody is still moving in the cars, we understand, and uh, uh, also welcome those who, who are connected on the, using the mobility services. Uh, it's the first time we have such online conferences, such a big uh, uh, auditorium. Uh, we have, uh, Today, uh, we gather here for the Ninth World Congress Aviation in the 21st century. And uh, we have uh, participants from China to Northern America. And uh, to open the, uh, our Congress, I will provide the floor or online floor to the director of the National Aviation University, Mr. Volodymyr Isayenko. Mr. Isayenko, please. Dear participants and guests of, of the Congress, in September, in September uh, 2003, the National Aviation University, Kiev, hosted of the First World Congress av Aviation in the 21st century. The main topic was the analysis of global trends, review of practical experimental and theoretical achievements of the field of civil aviation. The co-founder of the Congress, the numerous international organization, ACL, Council, Eurocontrol, SNECMA, and others. The Ministry of Education Science of U Ukraine, the National Acad Academy of Science of, U of Ukraine, the State Aviation Service of Ukraine, and the states in Enterprises Ukrasatsa also supported at launch of the holding of the Congress. This year, the National Aviation University is holding the Nine World Congress, Aviation of the 21st Century. The participants of this scientific forum have a great opportunity to demonstrate the vision of the global trends of aerospace technology in relation to the political and economic realities of today of the vis of overview of practical, experimental, and theoretical achievements of the field of civil aviation. The world is constantly changing borders as a disappearing inst instead under the pressure of social economic process of the globalization, new center of the world community of the emerging. Aviation takes priority of this process. The participants of the Congress have the opportunity of the joint of joint efforts of the solve of the most pressing problems of aviation, which are essential international. The most of processing issues of the aerospace industry have changed from the purely local of the regional common European and some have gained global status. The basis of the modern research strategy is the principle of the creating research pressure with the clarity of the defined factor, namely support and funding of the work of the predator and the topics mainly of the field of the theoretical justification of the latest breakthrough technologies. That is who uh, is Congress and colleges of the adoption of the new conception division of the problematic issues of the aerospace industry as a whole. Our country is ready to cooperate with the every country of the world that has significant scientific achievements of the field of aviation. Only by following this principle of the humanity create aviation, which can be called as aviation of the 21st century. It is the point of the uh, hold to, to uh, since symposium during the Congress. The pandemic made is the adjustments, but called of the prevents of the Congress. The organized uh, com uh, committee decided the hold of the forum online. A few words about the special other this year for the 
uh, first time in selection of the best world of the publication of the Scopus format was organized. I want to wish all the uh, participants of the Congress fruitful scientific research and creative inspiration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Isanka, for the opening uh, of our Congress. And uh, now to uh, 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 keep our schedule, I would like uh, to ask uh, our technicians to uh, uh, deliver the speech of uh, the president of the ICAO Council, Mr. Salvatore Schicitano. of the National Aviation University of Ukraine. Distinguished Rector Isenko, faculty and students of the National Aviation University of Ukraine, dear participants in the 9th National Aviation University World Congress on Aviation in the 21st Century, Safety in Aviation and Space Technology. It's my great privilege and pleasure today to address you at the opening of this important international congress. The National Aviation University is widely recognized as one of the most important institutions for aviation higher education in the world, fostering the next generation of highly skilled aviation professionals. For many years, it has been closely cooperating with ICAO on this objective, and our partnership has led to it graduating new aviation specialists from more than 77 countries and every world region. The strength and the value of this partnership has been established in numerous ways, including through the establishment of the NAUIKO European Regional Aviation Security Training Center. NAU graduates have proven their value to our sector many times over and are greatly appreciated globally for their high level of aviation professionalism. Their contribution can be seen across a variety of our current air transport challenges globally. And in light of the topic of this ninth World Congress, I would highlight here especially their influence on some of our newer models for aviation safety management. Similar NAU contributions are being appreciated by our sector today across the areas of strategic objectives for ICAO. And we look forward to its new graduates continuing to bring their energy and significant scientific achievements to everything they set their sights on. Looking to the objectives of this event, we must acknowledge that the aviation in the 21st century poses numerous and significant challenges to civil aviation stakeholders. As we have already witnessed, major innovations are today being realized in both men, unmanned, and space-based travel and trade, many of which have challenged our most basic understanding of what an aircraft is and of what their services can achieve for us as individuals and civil societies. I would therefore encourage you to recall that safety must remain a paramount concern where the introduction of new types of aircraft and aeronautical capabilities are concerned, and that the safe integration of new traditional services poses a monumental challenge to rule makers as ICAO and to regulators in our member states. Fortunately, we also have the most comprehensive system of global cooperation and standardization at our disposal to help address this. And events such as this one are instrumental in delivering insights and the perspectives which aid the ICAO process. Continuing to drive innovation and progress in the 21st century air transport through the ICAO will help us to assure that harmonization of standards and the national approaches fosters a flexible but safe air transport environment for the coming decades. In concluding, 
I wish to emphasize that the history of the university is one characterized by dedication, determination, and achievement. Aviation is proud to count the National Aviation University of Ukraine among the, our most appreciated aviation institutions for our learning, and I wish you only further success as you work to continue that tradition for many years to come. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, President of the Council, Mr. Salvatore Skeshtano. We are very grateful for such kind words for the university to address to us, to Ukraine and to international community, which is joined here. And uh, we we'll really appreciate the support of ICAO, which is provided to all countries and all organizations all over the world. And it's very important about the joint way ahead with the innovation, standardization, and new challenges uh, which we have to meet today. And now I would like to provide the floor to our big friend, uh, Mr. Henry Holloway, the Director General of, Euro of Mobility and Transport of European Commission. The, uh, Henrik, for a long time, he, was a, he is a chairman of the EU-Ukraine high-level dialogue on transport, and also he takes care about all European uh, uh, transportation system. Of course, Mr. Halalei, we are very happy and appreciate to welcome you here. Floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dimitro, and uh, thank you for your extremely kind uh, words of um, introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, uh, I'm very pleased uh, to join you from uh, Tallinn, not Brussels, but I should be in Brussels uh, by the evening. And uh, of course, uh, it's, uh, it's a big pleasure to, uh, to be invited uh, to the event organized by the National Aviation University in Ukraine, a university with a very um, long history and a very high reputation from a country which is uh, one of the cradles of uh, civil aviation and uh, also uh, aircraft uh, manufacturing. And of course, uh, the, uh, the topic is uh, very important, aviation in the 21st century, safety and space technologies. I think that we are here to uh, look uh, into the future. And of course, uh, uh, by looking backwards, uh, we also cannot uh, uh, look away from the current crisis that we are currently in. And I'm particularly pleased also to be with you because Ukraine is a country I care a lot about, and I'm very pleased of the cooperation we have had over the last years in aviation and transport more generally. As Dimitra already mentioned, with the former Minister of Transport, Mr. Omelian, we kicked off the EU-Ukraine Transport Dialogue, which is an important framework for our close cooperation. And I'm very much looking forward to visiting Ukraine again for another round of our fruitful and mutually reinforcing dialogue. I have also been very impressed of the Ukrainian aviation professionals who over decades have been innovative, future-oriented and real drivers of the industry in the world, whole world. Antonov has been a trendsetter in the past and I hope will come back with a bright future. I've also been very privileged to have many good friends among today's Ukrainian aviation professionals and I hope to be there to support you and to assist you. The past months have literally turned the aviation world upside down, forcing us to adapt to a new reality as people simply stopped traveling, stopped flying from one day to the next. We are facing the deepest recession in Europe since the Second World War, and in the past 75 years, we would have thought that what we are experiencing is uh, totally unthinkable. The forecasts for the economic growth are still highly uncertain, but of course, uh, they are very much on the negative side. The impact on the aviation sector has been catastrophic, not only for aircraft operators, but also for airports manufacturers, air navigation service providers, among others. Revenue evaporated from one day to the next. Eurocontrol estimates accumulated losses in the European network for airlines, airports, and ASPs to be around 140 billion euros. In this context, the Commission took unprecedented actions that also helped the transport sector, including full flexibility under the EU budgetary rules. As restrictions were lifted gradually and in a coordinated manner, passenger flights within Europe resumed in June, July. Unfortunately, however, a second wave of uncoordinated and 
from a health perspective, unsubstantiated restrictions across Europe slowed down the recovery in early August. Traffic is now 50% below 2019 levels, haven't not really grown much uh, from the beginning of August. This does not only impact the aviation sector and our economies, but it also affects people's connectivity and freedom of movement. Aviation has remained a vital activity in these times of economic uncertainty. No one can really predict when we will come back to normal. Some say it will not be before 2024. But one thing is sure, sooner or later, we will be back in pre-COVID situation. And then all the challenges present will come back and perhaps even with a much stronger impact. Aviation's one big challenge before the pandemic was its sustainability and the lack of scalable capacity. This has not changed and recovery needs to be smart and sustainable, addressing these challenges that have impacted aviation over the last decade. I will come back on these issues in a few minutes. We need to use the current crisis also to our benefit. After all, it is an opportunity as well. We need to modernize, tackle the well-known challenges and make aviation sector more resilient, competitive and sustainable. In this context, aviation safety remains together with security, which, as I like to say, is the other side of the same coin, our number one priority. Safety is the foundation of any efficient aviation system and is essential to ensure people's confidence in air transport. Aviation is a forerunner, as there is no other transport mode that is as safe and secure as aviation. This is a result of century-long focus on the key aspect, making sure it is safe to fly. Flying today is 10 times safer than 20 years ago, and our safety records are higher than ever. There is nevertheless no room for complacency. When it comes to safety, indeed, whereas there has been no fatal accident involving EU member states operators for the last three years, the number of fatal accidents worldwide has remained stable for the past decade and tragic accidents that occurred the past two years, notably those involving MAX aircraft, were a stark reminder of the threats we are facing and what civil aviation has to deal with. In the context of COVID, we had to react quickly in the Commission to ensure that the situation does not danger in any way aviation safety. I would like to highlight the hard work carried out in order to adopt and quickly publish a set of Commission implementing regulations to postpone dates of application of certain measures in the context of the COVID pandemic. Many aviation domains were affected, in particular air operations and ATM, and this action was essential to provide with the adequate relief to aviation authorities and industry. At the same time, and due to the impossibility to travel on mission, the Aviation Safety Agency, EASA, put in place a new system to carry out remote inspections, which has so far demonstrated that it can be very efficient. It goes without saying that none of the measures adopted will go against the safety of the system, our ultimate priority. In addition, the Commission and the ASA worked on numerous initiatives to tackle the COVID crisis, such as the Aviation Health Safety Protocol worked out with the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control as a joint document, defining measures to assure the health safety of air travellers and aviation personnel once airlines resume regular flight schedules following the severe disruption. Secondly, the Aviation Industry Charter, which establishes with the industry a monitoring model in order to fine-tune and improve the protocol in light of operational practice and further developments. A charter which is also open to the third countries like Ukraine and its operators and airports. It has also published guidelines in numerous ambits and safety uh, information bulletins, all addressing the maintenance of high safety safety standards while adapting in continue to work in the implementation of the provisions of the new EU rules and civil aviation safety, which was adopted in 2018. With this so-called basic regulation, we are set to deal with aviation safety of the future through a modern seem to be some problem with the microphone. Uh, with the new basic regulation, we are set to deal with the aviation safety of the future through modern, flexible, efficient, sustainable and cost-reducing framework, setting its sights on future challenges. One of the new main areas of activity uh, is the drones domain. Last year, the Commission adopted the first European drone rules, 
which set the overall framework for an operation-centric approach and, for, and allow simple drone operations in Europe's drone services market. In order to keep the regulatory burden as limited as possible, we do not want to impose automatically and systematically heavy certification or licensing requirements, but we focus on the risk of the type of operations. The next steps in drones domain will be the establishment of the use space, enabling more complex and more automated operations in safe, secure and green way in the airspace. And of course, it is very important um, that uh, we are able to share that with our good partners. In addition to highlighting these important home developments, I would like here now to highlight the important work that have been carried out in the international sphere. Basing it in the communication of an aviation strategy for Europe, uh, we maintain aviation dialogues with third countries, concluding and maintaining international air transport agreements. In parallel, the Commission allocates a growing amount of budget from uh, our uh, programs to technical cooperation and aviation partnerships throughout the world, leading up a considerable investment. We support in particular our international partners in the field of safety, and Ukraine has been no stranger to that. The, we also work very much on the air safety list, as you well know, and we don't only uh, criticize, we also very much engage. EASA, in view of its technical and aviation expertise is, and its proactive approach, is forging international relations and establishing the connections to get the best out of EU investment in technical cooperation and, of course, supporting the different programs. In terms of development cooperation for aviation safety, the EU key objectives are to increase safety oversight capacity in the countries concerned, supporting regional cooperation and development towards regional oversight and common market for aviation. Assistance at national level, in particular countries on the air safety list, and of course to support the, uh, the ICAO framework, no country left behind. We are investing quite a lot in order to make sure that our partners are also uh, improving uh, all their records. And that also includes the EU neighbourhood where we have launched aviation projects uh, benefiting eastern and southern neighbours. In this context, I would like to recall that the EU has also initialed the Common Aviation Area, the Common Aviation Area Agreement with Ukraine. The agreement aims at liberalizing the air market between EU and Ukraine. Yes, it has been there for a long time, but now I think we are finally getting there with the UK exiting formally and finally the Union on the 1st of January. I have full confidence that this agreement can finally be signed in the early months of next year because no obstacles would be there anymore and we can start benefiting fully from this agreement. Yes, I feel very bad that we have not been able to do that earlier, uh, but uh, that is why sometimes EU is considered a very complex animal. Going beyond the EU issues towards pan-European cooperation and ensuring that close cooperation with our closest neighbours in the region will continue to be a priority in the years to come, ECAC and ICAO are key partners to that end. We face big challenges internationally from other regions and when we act together, we are also collectively stronger. One of the priorities uh, of the Commission remains the reform of the single European sky. As it happens today, a few hours from now, Transport Commissioner Adina Valean will also present the new single European sky proposal and it is going to be adopted by the Commission today. This is there to modernize the ATM management and, of course, including the entire ECAC area to work in a more sustainable and efficient fashion. So we are definitely making some good progress. This new package will also propose changes for greater resilience, scalability and efficiency in the management of European skies, as well as, of course, removing available greenhouse emissions by flying environmentally more optimal routes. It's clear that air traffic management needs to be reformed to cope with the sustained air traffic growth over the last decade, and it will come back. Not tomorrow, it will come back. The significant unforeseen traffic variation. So it is very important that uh, we are making good progress here. And of course, we are counting on Ukraine support fully in this, in this context. I would consider it an utmost failure to comply, complete the recovery without addressing the structural and capacity problems we saw before the crisis. I therefore hope that the EU will be ambitious in this reform, as now is the time to make structural changes in the way air traffic is managed across Europe. 
Lastly, I just want to highlight the importance uh, in uh, focusing on sustainability as to make aviation more sustainable. We will pursue our work with a basket of measures that encompasses market-based measures with the emission trading scheme and Corsia, technological improvements with cleaner aircrafts, operational improvements with a single European sky and cleaner fuels. We need all those areas to make good progress. Sustainable aviation fuels have the potential to significantly reduce aircraft emissions, particularly liquid advanced biofuels and electrofuels, which are fully compatible with the current technology and already certified by EASA for up to 50% of the fuel used during a flight. But of course, this potential is untapped, and I'm sure that in the next decade, there will be significant process in this uh, domain. I firmly believe this is doable. We are ready to operate with transmission and scale up massively our production in the EU. Obviously, uh, we will continue to working also with our international partners like Ukraine. Dear friends, thank you once again for having given me the opportunity to address you. I wish you a very good conference today and I would have loved to be there in person as I always cherish the opportunity to visit your great country and to meet uh, good friends. Thank you very much for your attention. Stay well. Enjoy the interesting day to come. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Havalei, for your fundamental speech. And I have a good day. I have a good day. Thank you, Mr. Hale, for your fundamental speech. And uh, of course, there are so many comments on that that could be done. And uh, you provide us uh, really the very broad picture of the EU initiatives. And now we are sure that with the EU support, not only Ukraine, all the EU member states, and Ukraine as a partner, of course, and other non EU states will be able to overcome the difficulties which we have temporarily here. And of course, uh, we are looking forward to meet in person and uh, welcome you to visit Ukraine in a nearest uh, opportunity when you come. Also, thank you for the great news about ECA agreement. You know, I was a co-chairman of this uh, negotiation process for uh, eight or nine rounds. I even don't remember <laughs> uh, how many. And now I'm very happy to hear such a good news from you. And I hope that it will be completed ne next, uh, next year. And again, uh, Henrik, thank you very much. We feel that we have a great friend in the uh, European Union who supports us and uh, we are really uh, happy to have you uh, to have your vision which covers all all important areas from safety to uh, environment which uh, is really crucial for aviation now and thank you very much again for your uh, very optimistic message thank you henry and have a good day Uh, now I'm uh, delighted to provide the, our again online floor to Deputy Minister of Education and Science of Ukraine, Mr. Artur Selesky. Mr. Selesky, floor is yours. Hello, dear participants. Due to changes in your schedule, Mr. Selesky. Uh, sorry, there's a technical problem. Uh, pro problem with Mr. There's a technical problem so now. Now I give a floor to uh, academician, to our prominent uh, uh, scientist, to the academician of Ukraine Academy of Science, Mr. Uh, Yatskiv, please. Hello, uh, the chairman of organizing committee of Congress Aviation in the 21st century. Dear participants of Congress, it is my great, great pleasure and honor to welcome you on behalf of National Academy of Science of, of Ukraine and its institution, the main astronomical observatory of National Academy of Science of Ukraine. The topic of Congress is uh, security and space technology in aviation. It is very wide topics and very important topics closely related to the activity of the main astronomical observatory in field of GNSS technology. This is a field where uh, uh, observatory 
is closely cooperated with National Aviation University for a long time, and we have had many discussions on these uh, topics. As you know, uh, uh, at present day, the accurate position, navigation, and time provided by GNSS technology is the key for fast emerging scientific and industrial application. And we here in observatory for many years were involved in application of GNS technology for different purposes. First of all, we have established the permanent GNSS station in Ukraine, which uh, this network is closely uh, uh, related now to the network of other organization of Ukraine, uh, national, uh, space uh, agency, uh, private system solution uh, enterprises, and so on. Uh, uh, besides of this, we have operational GNSS center in, uh, in observatory. We have data center where we collected all the data over the world and uh, provide the differential correction for the position. And uh, also we have the study center in observatory involved in different application uh, and, and use of uh, GNSS uh, data for studies, uh, earth rotation, for studies, uh, uh, deformation, uh, uh, plate motion, and so on, so on. One of the topic, this is very important and related to the, uh, conf to the conference uh, 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 topics is uh, that uh, observatory in cooperation with Kharkiv National Radio Electronic University has proposed and elaborated the new approach for construction multi-positional phase system for trajectory measurement and navigation of moving object. The name of this uh, new system is Vega 5 and we hope in the near future uh, to present you the new software, a method for, for using for the navigation of moving objects. In any case, uh, I appreciate very high activity uh, of, uh, of scientists of National Aviation University in field of navigation uh, uh, and uh, uh, using the navigation system for, uh, for different purposes and of course for aviation purposes. Thank you very much, uh, you uh, uh, University, National Aviation University, for your uh, activity for many years. And even in this difficult case, you have organized uh, online this Congress, which is very important. And I congratulate you on behalf of Presidium of National Academy of Science. Good luck and good success. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Academician Yaski, for such um, uh, kind words and for such comprehensive uh, uh, view on this uh, the, on the topic of the implementation of GNSS and the global navigation systems. Um, I, I still remember how we prepared the agreement between the EU and Ukraine on Galileo applications and uh, how much you force you put uh, personally with us in the team when we did the uh, extension of RIMS, differential stations to Ukraine under the European uh, European programs, and uh, I wish you also an, uh, all success in your scientific work, and uh, uh, we uh, really feel the support of Ukrainian National Academy of Science, and the main thing, of course, is to keep uh, knowledge, to transfer the knowledge to the next generations, and uh, we are really appreciate what you do and your personal input and input of all academicians of Ukraine. Thank you very much, Academician Yaskiv, for your participation. We hope you stay in line. Uh, with our colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It is very and, and now uh, I would like to provide the floor uh, to the representative of the Ministry of um, Science and Education of Ukraine, uh, Mrs. Uh, Yulia Bezverchenko. Please, Ms. Bezverchenko, the floor is yours. Nice to see all the participants of the Congress. Uh, I'm happy to hear you and I think that it's very important that in the new challenges of COVID-19 reality, we are able to be together to uh, exchange our knowledge and our motivation to uh, move further. 
So the dream about the sky, the dream about the flight well, the, from the very beginning one was the one of the among the most important uh, drivers of scientific and technological progress. Of course, uh, um, uh, aviation is the sphere where the science, innovation and even education are very important. So, of course, we understand this and we understand that uh, in the case uh, the, if uh, there is a strong and uh, aligned uh, policy of the state in this sphere, that there is an opportunity to and the progress in aviation too. In this sense, uh, uh, the Ministry of Education and Science uh, performs uh, many uh, in order to create more strong science, more strong innovation sphere, and uh, uh, after all, to create the Ukraine like a knowledge-based economy and society. Um, talking about the aviation, I'm happy that in Ukraine we have the strong community of uh, scientists, the strong community of universities, uh, of scientific organizations who are keen enough, uh, uh, have the strong expertise in the areas which are needed for aviation, which are needed for their uh, future um, um, movement in this sphere. The universities like uh, to our today's uh, organizer, uh, National Aviation University, Kharkiv, of uh, Aviation Institute, uh, Kyiv Polytechnic Institute, and many others uh, uh, give us the um, idea of uh, the strong uh, uh, aviation in Ukraine. So, of course, we all uh, have to uh, understand that only in this situation, when we have the strong ecosystem of the scientists, of innovators, and then all, all the stages needed to create aircraft uh, till the uh, aircraft plane, then we will have the serious results. So I want just to uh, provide you uh, the uh, idea that uh, in Ukraine we are uh, thinking about all this. We understand that uh, from every uh, stakeholder uh, we need uh, the strong commitment and many actions in order to create this ecosystem. And uh, I am happy that today we can exchange our thoughts and exchange our ideas in this sphere. And I hope that everyone can do everything possible. And as a result, we will have a strong uh, Ukraine with strong aviation. So have a nice day and a very fruitful cooperation in future. Thank you, Mrs. Bezverchenko, for your very kind words, and uh, uh, thank you for the efforts of the ministry in the such difficult situation to support the, of course, the, your, uh, uh, the, the uh, university and uh, also the industries of Ukraine. So thank you very much and uh, have a great day, and we wish you all the best in such uh, turbulent times. Uh, and now I'm happy to give a floor to our big guest uh, from uh, Eurocontrol, Mr. Philippe Merlot, the old friend of mine. Mr. Merlot is director of uh, ATM, but it's in very broad sense. Uh, he also takes care about the civil military integration, about uh, the drone simple applications and the many other things. And uh, I'm uh, happy to provide the floor now to you, Philippe. Please, floor is yours. So, Dimitri, can you hear me well? Yes, uh, yes, yes, we can hear you well. Okay, first of all, thank you for uh, the invitation. It's good to talk to you again. And of course, Ukraine is an uh, important uh, member of Eurocontrol and a member state that is uh, dear to our uh, heart. And, and it's do good to contribute to this. Congress and, and to this conference. I believe that this conference is uh, very timely and very relevant. Of course, we are today in, in um, the worst uh, ever uh, crisis for, uh, for aviation. And uh, I would like to start uh, with uh, expressing my uh, solidarity with all the aviation stakeholders that are uh, struggling uh, today for. Uh, for uh, recovering and, and uh, for their survival. Uh, your, in Eurocontrol, we have uh, done our utmost uh, to, to help and to support. You know that uh, we have uh, decided to defer uh, some uh, route charges. We have also offered the possibility uh, for a very interesting bank loan. And of course, 
we are providing statistics in order to monitor closely the, the, the recovery. Uh, and, and of course, we will continue to, to, to support uh, all our stakeholders to, to, for this recovery. But, but uh, whatever the difficulties, uh, uh, this crisis is no excuse to stop thinking about the future of aviation. And, and this is where your Congress is very relevant, particularly when uh, we know that uh, when the traffic will be back uh, and when the crisis will be over, we will be faced with new challenges. And, and uh, I would like to, to focus my speech on some of these uh, challenges. And let me start, of course, with the challenge of decarbonation that uh, we will have to, to live up to uh, in aviation. Uh, in 2018, uh, uh, aviation in Europe burned roughly 50 million tons of kerosene and emitted 160 million tons of CO2. This will need to go down to zero in the year 2050 to comply with the objective of the European Commission Green Deal. This is a huge challenge in, in front of us. And of course, we need to raise awareness among all the aviation stakeholders about the difficulty of this challenge. Uh, we need to develop a, a credible roadmap to meet uh, such uh, a challenge. And of course, it's uh, such a, a big challenge that it can only be a, a combination of different solutions. Uh, carbon offsetting uh, will provide a temporary mitigation. The ATM improvement uh, could also contribute, but we will need to uh, investigate and to activate all the capabilities of sustainable alternative fuels biofuels and synthetic fuel, and we will need to activate aircraft, new aircraft and new engine technology. And I was glad to hear last week that Airbus has decided to launch three new uh, aircraft concepts, all based on uh, hydrogen uh, propulsion. So this is a first huge challenge. We are just at the beginning of the road to solve it. And, and we have a, a huge effort in, in front of us. The, the second challenge I would like to mention is the arrival of many new entrants uh, at all different uh, altitudes. And of course, we'll need to uh, facilitate the integration of these new entrants and to enable their, uh, their, their operation in, in the airspace. At low, a very low altitude, of course, we have all the drones uh, for inspection or for good deliveries. Uh, in, in controlled airspace, we will have mainly uh, military and governmental drones uh, that we will need to integrate. And also at very high uh, altitude, we have uh, all sorts of balloons, airships, propelled gliders, pseudo-satellites, stratospheric flights that we will need to, to, to manage. So uh, here again, a very big challenge. Uh, we need uh, to develop uh, a credible uh, operational concept and a robust uh, regulatory framework and a clear regulatory framework we are working on it uh, with the EASA, with the CESAR joint undertaking, with the European Commission, and we, with all the relevant uh, aviation uh, stakeholders. Of course, to be able to tackle uh, this decarbonization and these new entrants, the air traffic management system will need to evolve. And this leads me to the third and last challenge uh, I wanted to mention, it's time now to industrialize and to deploy a new, more digitalized air traffic management system. We have pulled together uh, many building blocks. We have the CESAR solutions concerning the business trajectory, concerning the free route, 
concerning uh, wake vortex uh, separation reduction, timeless separation. Uh, we can rely on many new assets uh, that are already operational and the VDL2 uh, new data link between the cockpit uh, and, and the ground, the ADSB uh, navigation and surveillance. We can rely on, on the satellite for navigation with Galileo, for surveillance with the Aereon system, for communication with the uh, Inmarsat. So we have all the components. Uh, it's time to pull them all together in a, uh, and to coordinate them in a common and unique program, and it's time to, to deploy. Then we will be able to rely and, and to activate all the capabilities of artificial intelligence that uh, is very fit for uh, aviation, as aviation is quite a repetitive activity, but very complex due to uh, a lot of driving factors. So uh, here again, uh, developing a, a new ATM system, more digitalized, more scalable, more resilient, more flexible. Uh, this is uh, in front of us. And, and uh, I would like to, to, to praise and to mention the initiative promoted by the European Commission, this new partnership for uh, integrated ATM that we called CESAR-3. Uh, and and uh, I think uh, everybody should contribute to that and support uh, that uh, European Commission initiative. Uh, let me conclude by uh, a strong call for enhanced cooperation. And here I am back to the present crisis. We have a huge shortage of cash in the system uh, today. All the budgets for investment, for recruitment have been blocked and even, even more cut down. So we will succeed, we will be able to move forward only if we are able to better share our remaining resources in a common European-wide uh, uh, program. So uh, let's, let's do it, let's join our, our forces and, and in order to, to move forward. So uh, in summary, uh, we are experiencing a difficult time, but we have a future for uh, aviation with new challenges a challenging future, but also an uh, exciting future. So let's work together to, to live up to these uh, expectations. And um, I will leave it there. Thank you, Dimitri. Th thank you very much for your uh, very um, interesting uh, uh, speech, for an inter interesting presentation of the activities of Eurocontrol. And uh, we are really excited to see that uh, you cover many things and not only pure atm issues but also issues related to new aircraft biofuels carbon free future new technologies hydrogen and all other things uh, of course uh, we fully agree with you that uh, we need to put our joint fo forces to overcome the current situation current crisis but as uh, our uh, mr hololay said there is also the new opportunities and we found uh, many new things during this crisis uh, many new ways how to communicate interact and overcome difficulties so with these new challenges uh, we all together we will uh, of course come to the new future for aviation and thank you again philip for joining us and we are really grateful to eurocontrol for the whole support provided to ukraine uh, as uh, uh, in atm area but also institutionally and for training of our students from national aviation university thank you very much thank you So sorry, I have interferences in my headphones, so I have to take it off sometimes. And now I should ask Mr. Professor Hope from uh, director, director of the Institute of Aerospace and Cyber Law of the University of Cologne, whether Mr. Hope, you are ready to take a floor. Sir, thank you very much for giving me the parole. So um, let me just prepare my few slides. 
Nee, der Host, die können das nicht teilen, weil der Host ist nicht zulässt. Es geht nicht. Achso, okay. Geht nicht. Geht nicht. Nicht. Okay. I thank you very much uh, for this very kind introduction. For me, it's a very nice opportunity actually to welcome you all to this exciting day, to this exciting conference to which I cannot participate in full, but I will give you some of my thoughts about the European aviation post COVID-19 scenario, some observations and perspectives. Not all of them, but you know, kind of a variety of important things. As you know, the year 2020 has been characterized by the outbreak of an infection disease caused by an influenza virus belonging to the family of coronavirus, never seen before in humans and labeled as SARS-CoV-2 or more commonly COVID-19. In the actual fact, the first appearance of the latest discovered coronavirus, which among other malfunctions of the bodies causes severe pneumonia largely traces back to October, November 19, 2019, where it rapidly spread in the Chinese megalopolis of Wuhan. COVID-19 is not much different from previous academic outbreaks registered since 2000, as it belongs to the same genus as the severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, and the Middle East respiratory syndrome, MERS, which had too a significant impact worldwide. The global health situation has received institutional recognition with the World Health Organization describing it as a public health emergency and officially declaring it to be a pandemic on 11 March, 2020. And uh, most of us believe that currently it will not be over very quickly, but it will take on. And I want to actually show you some of the immediate impacts on the aviation industry. Air transport in general and European air transport in particular, undoubtedly among the sectors that have been hardest hit by the pandemic outbreak. As a matter of fact, the rapid diffusion of the infection throughout the European continent, along with the imposition of travel and migrations, bans across all member states of the European Union, have determined an unprecedented and unparalleled stall in air traffic, which an overall, with an overall reduction of international passengers estimated between 50 and 80% in the first month of 2020 as compared to 2019. As the EU air transport market is in highly densely congested environment, it shall not surprise that data from Eurocontrol report a prodigious fall in aircraft operation which during the month of April, May and June 2020 has reached historic minimum levels of minus 89% as compared to last year's traffic. This is not only due to the rapid and uncontrolled spread of the infection, but also to the fact that social travel and migration restrictions have made crossing border within the EU impossible. In addition, the EU itself has suspended all air traffic and movements from and to extra EU countries, de facto closing the Union borders as of last May, May, March 2020. This has, of course, now dispensed. Reg regrettably, forecasts do not pr predict a fast recovery, with figures indicating that only between the end of the year and the beginning of 2021, intra EU air traffic will partially recover with expectation of 25 to 30% less aircraft movement and passengers as compared to the same month of 2019. The COVID-19 pandemic outbreak had and continues to do so unprecedented and immense social, logistic, economic and political repercussions. On a global scale, what captures the attention is the financial damage that the global airline industry is currently facing quantified in the order of over 250 billion US dollar in the first quarter of 2020. Numbers are continuously growing as air traffic is still considerably below average standards. Losses do not only directly stem from the operational stall, but comprise a large number of items, including, for example, rental payments, slot fees, airport charges, financial compensations to passengers. 
In Europe, losses related to the first half of 2020 are quantified in over 78 billion euro, with several national markets severely affected, particularly Spain, Italy, and France. The reaction of EU airlines has been rather uniform, with several carriers grounding their entire fleets at Ryanair and Swiss. Lufthansa has grounded a large part of its fleet at the moment. The European Union's reactions uh, uh, were as follows. The outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic has urged the EU to react in a comprehensive and harmonious manner. In the area of air transport, the EU possibly faced one of the biggest challenges since the three regulatory packages of liberalization of air services adopted in the years 18, 1987 to 1992. In this slide, the European Commission also upon requests and recommendations coming from EU airlines and industry associations has been carefully attentive of the factual and political development and has promptly addressed a variety of critical issues. First, airport slot allocation. The first intervention relates to the area of slot allocation. This area is governed by regulation number 95 slash 93 out of 1993, providing common rules on slot allocation at EU airports. According to this regulation, airlines shall use at least 80% of their takeoff and landing slots in order to be granted the right to use the same slot in the following year. This industry practice is also known as grandfathering rights or 80% rule, and you know it all. Given the discussed travel restrictions and the stall in air operations, doubts and concerns per pertaining to the application of such provisions rapidly arose with the aviation community. As early as 2 March 2020, the International Air Transport Association and the Airport Council International urged regulators and requested that rules governing slot allocation be suspended for the year 2020. Welcoming the industry recommendations and acknowledging the extraordinariness of the pandemic outbreak on 30 March 2020, the EU adopted the regulation formally amending the above referred EU legal regime for slot allocation. The legislative measure establishes a temporary framework applicable only 24 until 24 October 2020, but a final evaluation of the duration of these ex extraordinary measures will be made on 15 September 2020. Then the regulation of air services in the EU is as contained in uh, the famous regulation 1008 of 2008, which provides basic rules as to the freedom of establishment of airlines. The legal regime has in fact revolutionized the provision and the structure of air traffic in Europe with a de facto liberalization and de facto um, um, an abandoning of the reserve of cabotage. Notably among the requirements set out for the insurance issuance of EU air operator licenses, the regulation requires air carriers to demonstrate a solid financial stability and viability. On these grounds, member states may revoke or suspend the operating license of any air carrier which may not be able to fulfill its financial obligations. And uh, the temporary framework not only suspends the application of the financial conditions for air, EU air carriers, but also introduces a section relating to emergency measures relating to COVID-19. As to air cargo operations on 26 March, the European Commission issued a communication providing guidelines for the operation of air cargo services within and from the EU. As with regard to passenger protection, the diffusion of the infection of COVID-19, along with the numerous travel and migration restrictions imposed globally and in Europe resulted in a completely unprecedented situation whereby most EU airlines canceled their entire schedules. This determined a never seen before amount of canceled flights within the EU, with consequently huge repercussions for both airlines and customers. The EU is one of the few world regions having a systematic legal regime concerning air passenger rights, which is, as you know, outlined in Regulation 261 of 2004. The reaction of EU airlines to the immense number of flight cancellations have, has been that of offering customers 
digital monetary vouchers, usually at the, of the moment corresponding to the ticket price paid by the passenger. Vouchers generate benefits for airlines as not having to reimburse passengers. They do not have to suffer liquid liquidity difficulties. But in Germany, there are court decisions that say it is not allowed to just uh, have the indemnification via voucher. The customer is entitled to get his money, his or her money back. Then the very important uh, field of um, area of, of uh, state aid. State aid is usually a rather delicate and sensitive matter comprising social, economic, and political opportunities and considerations. It should not come as a surprise, therefore, that the tremendous economic impact of the current COVID-19 pandemic has early triggered compelled substantial doubts and issues. State aid regulation has been one of the first areas in which the EU intervened since the outbreak of the pandemic. Already in March 2020, the European Commission issued a communication establishing a temporary framework for state and measures, uh, state aid measures, sorry, to support the economy in the current COVID-19 outbreak. This forms part of a broader coordinated economic response that the EU has promoted against the negative effects of COVID-19 on the union's economy. This, there is normally a prohibition and this has been levied and has given the chance, for example, to Lufthansa in the Federal Republic of Germany of 9.5 billion EU, uh, Euro. Huh? And Air France KLM, the same, and the British Airways as well. So there were huge amounts of state aid, which is normally a thing that is really seen very critically. Then safety related measures and uh, to the role of the European Aviation Safety Agency here in Cologne, besides postponing the entering into force of regulation number 2019 in the area of unmanned aircraft operation, which is now expected to take effect early 2021, EASA, the European Aviation Safety Agency has issued relevant and helpful guidance material in the areas of crew member qualification and aircraft operation at large, providing a health safety protocol which details requirements, procedures, checks, and measures that both operators, personnel, and passengers shall observe. I come to some concluding remarks, Mr. President. At the time of writing, the European aviation industry is slowly restarting operations. While this is, of course, a bit shaky at the moment, forecasts predict that although slight and timid signs of recovery will increase maybe later this year, intra-EU air traffic will still be well below average until the end of 2020. The COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated that rapid and vertiginous uh, changes in the normal aircraft operations and more generally to the usual global political and transport scenario do require swift regulatory and political adaptations as for instance, uh, for instance the airline industry is naturally linked to social and political development on a much larger scale. The EU's response to a vertiginous fall in demand has been significant, but whether new initiatives will be necessary to support the aviation and airline industry will very much depend on the development of the diffusion of the pandemic outbreak, as well as on the political measures that will be adopted at the national level by member states. Unfortunately, I must say at this instance, it looks very much so that we are not over the crisis, but that it will go on. While some measures are likely to remain temporary in nature, some others will probably need more time to be further and thoroughly addressed by the EU legislator. For instance, areas such as passenger rights and state aid are likely to continue producing their effects in the next month. And consequently, the union will evaluate whether to extend, renew, or even make some temporary amendments more permanent. And as of as I say, I read we read in the newspaper that Lufthansa has grounded a large portion of its fleet, 160 mid-size aircraft for a longer time. Uh, so that we are looking 
and, and of course, everybody is looking a bit nervous into the coming season, fall and, uh, and winter. Let's hope that the pandemic is not increasing so much so that we can hope for the better. And we should always hope for the better. I thank you very much for your attention. It was a great pleasure and honor for me to speak to you. I hope it wasn't the last time. Thank you very much and good deliberations in your Congress. Thank you. Dmitry, sorry, but we can't hear you. Your mic is off. Can you hear me now? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much, Professor Hope, for your very comprehensive uh, uh, speech and very comprehensive view on the COVID-19 problem. Of course, it's a very broad issue, and uh, the problem we have now, it's a different approach. It's in every country, it's a different standards and uh, a different methods how to recover. Of course, hopefully, some uh, in some economies, they, 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 there is opportunity to provide the state help, state aid. In some economies, aviation is, uh, couldn't uh, rely on such kind of uh, protection, but uh, we need really the uniform approach and uh, how to um, uh, process these crises. And this uh, crisis will, will come uh, to the end of the one day, but after that we have experience, we'll have experience for future, how to overcome such kind of problems. And of course, uh, uh, we should uh, take this experience also to um, adapt our industry for the uh, uh, spreadable diseases, any kind of disease, and to use this methodology in future as well. And thank you again for your very good words and for your very optimistic uh, conclusions. Thank you, Professor, and all the best to you. And uh, I don't hope, I'm not hoping that it's the last time, but the last time for this subject. And you're always welcome. Have a good day. Bye bye. And now uh, I'm very happy to present our guest from uh, IASA, uh, Jean Marc Guzot. Uh, the, uh, who will provide us the view on innovation facing new challenges. Uh, Jean-Marc is a principal advisor to the executive director of the uh, European Union Innovation Safety Agency. And uh, there are several times IASA was mentioned in the different uh, presentations and different speeches this morning. And now I would, I'm very happy to give a floor to the representative of this respected organization. Please, Jean-Marc, floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, delighted to uh, be invited to uh, speak at this very important event on behalf of uh, EASA. Uh, I will not come back to what EASA is currently doing uh, on the COVID-19 uh, crisis. As you mentioned, uh, Professor Hope and also Enrico Lolai already mentioned what the agency is, uh, is doing uh, to support the industry. What I would like just to stress again is that we at EASA, we are fully committed to uh, support uh, the industry uh, during those uh, difficult uh, times. I would like to share a presentation with you and, 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 and for this, I need to get the permission to share my presentation. So if you could uh, uh, do something, uh, because I, I try to share my presentation and uh, I don't have at this stage the permission to show my presentation on the screen. So if, uh, I could technically have uh, the solution for that. It would be um, it, it would be great. So as soon as I got the permission, I will I will, I will do it. So the, the the presentation that I'm going hopefully to be able to share in a, in a moment is uh, about uh, the challenges of innovation and how uh, an aviation safety agency uh, like uh, us uh, should uh, tackle uh, uh, innovation should meet the challenges of uh, innovation. 
uh, innovation is uh, is not new uh, in the aviation sector. I would say that innovation is from the beginning in the DNA of uh, aviation. What is uh, currently new is uh, that we are currently in a phase where uh, the pace of innovation has uh, increased uh, tremendously. So now I'm going to share my presentation. Uh, I just need a, a moment to uh, put it on the screen. Uh, just uh, hold on a moment. Yes. So I, I hope you can see you can see my uh, my, my presentation. Um, we at uh, EASA we are um, fully committed to uh, support uh, in innovation, and at the same time, as a safety agency, we have to ensure that uh, innovation is introduced in the aviation sector in a safe way. So it's a, a kind of a contradictory uh, challenge that we have to, uh, to, uh, to meet, supporting innovation and making it uh, safe. So we have identified four key challenges that we have to, to meet in order to uh, support innovation as a regulator. The first challenge is to uh, adapt our regulatory framework to allow for early implementation of uh, innovation. Developing regulations, uh, amending regulations is quite a lengthy process uh, because it is a democratic process, which means that we have to involve stakeholders in the development of regulations. We have uh, to uh, organize public consultation to ensure that all uh, affected parties uh, can provide uh, input and this uh, takes uh, time. So we have uh, to uh, change our approach to uh, ensure that uh, the pace at which we uh, amend our regulations is commensurate now with uh, the increased uh, pace of uh, innovation. The, the second challenge is how to adapt our processes to new technologies and here I'm thinking in particular of our certification uh, process. Uh, we have uh, quite uh, stable and robust certification uh, processes. And what we discover now with new technologies is that those processes are not adapted to uh, certain new technologies. I'm thinking in particular of uh, artificial intelligence, where currently uh, today we can see a number of projects involving artificial intelligence. And we are at a stage where we do not know today how to certify artificial intelligence. Another type of challenges, for instance, is the fact that in a few years time, uh, we may uh, face with uh, the need to certify a new product based fully or almost fully on simulation. The third challenge is uh, what we know, the uh, knowledge uh, asymmetry. With the quick development of new technology, there is a risk for an agency like uh, uh, ours, uh, whose uh, main asset is the competence of uh, its experts, there is a risk that uh, the, the competence uh, of our experts in new technology is lagging behind. So we have to ensure that our experts uh, will um, grow uh, their competence on new technology as qu quickly as possible in order to uh, meet the pace of uh, change that uh, we see in the new technologies. And the fourth challenge, and uh, which was uh, already uh, mentioned uh, earlier by uh, Philippe Marleau, is new entrants. The challenge with new entrants in the aviation community is on both uh, sides. Uh, new entrants have to learn uh, from uh, us uh, on uh, aviation safety. Uh, aviation safety, uh, I think it was mentioned by uh, Enrico Lolai that we have reached uh, uh, quite an outstanding level of aviation uh, safety. Uh, this outstanding level has been built not only on technology, not only on safety regulations, but also on a safety culture which is uh, shared by uh, all players in the ecosystem. And new entrants, as we observe, do not necessarily have this uh, safety culture. And it's vital for the aviation ecosystem that those new entrants uh, get this uh, common safety culture 
so as to ensure that the systems, the overall ecosystem remains uh, safe. So we are recommitted to take new entrants on board to ensure that they share the same safety culture as uh, ours. The second challenge uh, with new entrants is that on our side, we learned from the new technologies that they uh, develop. So it's also vital from that point of view to integrate new entrants in uh, our uh, ecosystem. So in order to meet those uh, four challenges, we have identified at EASA six pillars of innovation uh, uh, management. I'm going to go clockwise on this presentation. The first pillar is to organize innovation as part of uh, our uh, business. Uh, we want innovation to be uh, part of our daily activities. And for this, we have set up you now a couple of years ago uh, an innovation cell, which is a small uh, agile uh, structure of uh, four persons reporting to uh, all uh, the uh, operational directorate in the agency and myself reporting to the executive director. The role of this innovation cell is to create a dynamic of innovation in the uh, agency and to coordinate and report uh, to high level on all innovation, uh, innovative uh, projects that may affect the uh, agency activity in terms of regulations or processes. The, the, the second pillar is to be technology agnostic, in particular to ensure that our regulations will be adapted to not only the current innovations, but also the future innovations to come. And for this, we are committed to move progressively more and more towards performance-based regulations. The third pillar is to actively adapt our methodologies. One example is uh, to prepare for artificial intelligence certification, and I will come back to that in a moment. The fourth pillar is to uh, engage with uh, new entrants, as I uh, explained, uh, in order to learn from them and that also they learn from us on the safety culture. The fifth pillar is uh, to learn from uh, uh, industry. And that's a very important aspect of uh, our policy on innovation. That is that we are developing a number of partnerships with industry in order to work together with industry at the early stage of innovative projects in order to um, learn as early as possible on new technologies. And we have developed a number of what we call innovation partnership contracts where our experts work with the industry on their innovative projects in order to learn from innovation and also to provide them with our expertise on aviation safety. And finally, the sixth pillar is to have innovation as a corporate uh, value. We have set up an internal innovation network in the agency. We have uh, more than 130 colleagues participating. And the purpose of this network is to create a dynamic of innovation in the uh, agency and uh, to facilitate the sharing of knowledge and uh, experience among ESA staff on new technologies, be it uh, single pilot operations, uh, blockchain, uh, artificial intelligence, and so on and so forth. Now I'm going to give a, a quick focus on uh, three um, innovations and how we tackle uh, those uh, innovations. The first one is uh, artificial uh, intelligence. We can already see uh, quite a number of projects uh, involving uh, artificial intelligence. We are at a stage where those projects do not include any safety critical aspect of artificial intelligence. It's more about providing assistance, for instance, to the, uh, the, the, the pilot. In order to uh, prepare the agency to uh, the first uh, certification of uh, artificial intelligence uh, system, we have published in February of uh, uh, this year, uh, an artificial intelligence uh, roadmap so you can find it very easily on the agency uh, website. The purpose of uh, this uh, roadmap is uh, for the agency to identify the opportunities and the challenges created by the introduction of artificial intelligence in uh, aviation. It identifies uh, how this may impact the agency in terms of organization, processes, and regulations. And uh, it identifies also a list of, uh, of actions, we have a program of actions that the agency should undertake to meet those, um, uh, those, those challenges. Uh, this being a roadmap, we have aligned these, uh, those actions with uh, what we know from the key uh, industry uh, projects. 
which means that the timelines of this roadmap is aligned with those projects in order to ensure that we will be ready on time to certify those innovative uh, projects, including uh, involving artificial uh, intelligence. In this artificial intelligence roadmap, uh, you will find uh, the vision of the agency uh, on the certification of artificial intelligence, and in particular, the building blocks in order to certify artificial intelligence. And I think what is interesting with uh, this is that it goes beyond uh, aviation safety because there is a very important uh, aspect on artificial intelligence. That's the ethical dimension in terms of, for instance, uh, data privacy, in terms of uh, non-discrimination. Uh, uh, th th these are two examples. And we, uh, as the agency, uh, are convinced, and we are happy to see that that's also the approach of, uh, uh, of some industrial partners, that we cannot certify artificial intelligence without having this wider vision where we encompass all the challenges of artificial intelligence that go far beyond safety. It goes also, uh, as I said, um, uh, about uh, data protection, privacy, non-discrimination, and so on and so forth. Practically, on artificial intelligence, uh, so we have set up uh, internally uh, a group of uh, uh, people uh, with uh, more than 30 people uh, in charge of the implementation of this uh, roadmap. But more importantly, we have started the practical work and we have a partnership contract with a, a, a small startup, a Swiss startup called uh, Dedalin, and with them, we work concretely on an artificial intelligence uh, project. And uh, through this uh, project, our intent is to uh, develop the first usable guidance on the certification of artificial intelligence. Second focus, single pilot operations. We see quite a number of projects coming to, uh, to us on uh, single pilot uh, operations uh, for large uh, transport uh, aircraft. What is interesting is that we see different technologies being uh, proposed uh, to compensate for uh, the lack of the second uh, pilot. It can be through ground assistance to uh, uh, advance cockpit with uh, workload of elevation means. It can be through artificial intelligence and so on and so forth. Uh, in order to be ready for the certification of uh, those uh, single pilot operations uh, aircraft, uh, having in mind that um, uh, the industry uh, want to be ready by 2030, we have set up a task force uh, with dedicated persons uh, with uh, the, the right uh, competencies in, uh, in all the possible uh, domains to start the work on defining the agency policy on the certification of single pilot operations. And in parallel, we also work with uh, a few industrial partners on partnership contracts in order to work concretely on those projects. So to learn in real time on those projects before they start the certification phase. And quickly, the third uh, focus, hybrid electric uh, aviation. Uh, we know it's coming. Uh, it's already present at EASA because uh, a couple of months ago, we already certified uh, our uh, first uh, small electric uh, aircraft. Huh? We gave a, a type certificate to, uh, to PP Strel. Uh, we also see a number of, of uh, projects uh, uh, coming. Uh, most of you have uh, seen the press release from uh, Airbus on the three uh, models of uh, hydrogen propulsion that they are going to uh, work on in the coming years. We are also fully committed to work with those industry partners on those uh, projects. And here again, we set up a partnership contract with uh, those uh, companies in order to uh, work as early as possible on those new technologies. So this is a snapshot of uh, what we are uh, doing on uh, innovation at uh, EASA. In summary, I would say that in order to support uh, innovation, and that's our commitment, but to make it safe because our mandate is uh, to maintain the highest level of safety uh, possible, there are, I would say, uh, three uh, main things to be remembered. The first thing is that we need to be agile uh, in terms of adapting our regulations and the processes. We need to invest in people competence on new technologies and uh, we need to work in partnership with the industry. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentation. And uh, I think it's um, uh, very interesting to know the innovative part of EAS activities. Everyone knows the certification, the oversight, the standardization, but with the innovation approach, it's very important to be online with the time. Of course, there's still an issue of the uh, synergy between the international publications and standards and SARPs of ICAO and the uh, EASA regulations which are issued. And, uh, that uh, the current activity of EASA, which you all know, but uh, the uh, the new challenges with electric air, uh, aircraft, whole aviation ecosystems, uh, data, uh, artificial intellect, it was very interesting for everyone, especially also for scientific uh, uh, community. And uh, uh, we, we see that uh, there's a lot of opportunities on the communication and joint work between uh, EASA industry and the scientific community. And again, John Marks, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. And uh, now I would like to thank you very much. The floor uh, to uh, Andrei Yermak, the uh, chief executive officer, the director, acting director of Ukrainian State Air Traffic Service Enterprise. Andrei, please. Здравствуйте, uh, коллеги. Hello, everybody. Do you hear me? Everything's fine. Yeah, all okay. Yeah. Uh, dear Mr. Rector, dear international guests and partners, I am very pleased to welcome you on the annual World, uh, World Congress Aviation in the 21st century. Uh, for me, it's, uh, let's say, a double honor to, to, to be a speaker here because the National Aviation University is uh, my second home. I am double graduate uh, from, the, from this university myself. And I can confidently say that the knowledge acquired in this university has largely determined my future and my passion to aviation. So, uh, uh, from one side, yeah. from another side, we we, uh, we all obviously realize that the modern equipment uh, and qualified personnel are determining uh, are the the main determining factors of the of the success nowadays. This is why the Yuxatse is very proud for the close cooperation with the university, which prepares the, the most important component of our success is a well, well trained, well educated specialist who are ready to, to overcome the old challenging task. Uh, from, other, uh, from other hand, I would like to thank uh, thanks to our international partners, Eurocontrol, uh, Eurocommission, IASA for the constant support in these difficult times and they are really uh, re uh, reliable partners and we are very thankful for, for the cooperation and for their constant support. Um, as you all know, the current aviation is going through the very tough times and the pandemic has set the industry back by 10 years. And we do all our best in order to overcome, the, uh, overcome this crisis with uh, minimal losses. Yeah. From, um, yeah, from our perspective uh, as a Yuxatse, let's say that the crisis time began from 2014 with the annexion of the Crimea uh, and the war on the east part of Ukraine. So let's say that the crisis is became our new reality, and we are we are trying to deal to deal with it starting from 2014 and to do all our best to overcome it with the minimal losses. Uh, Concerning, concerning our daily work, our daily operation, with, uh, we as a provider, as an enterprise with the, uh, of the critical infrastructure of Ukraine, we are ensure the 24-7 operations efficiency of the air navigation infrastructure, provision of the air navigation services and the flight safety. And at this moment, we, we implemented a, a lot of efforts in order to, to minimize the, even the possibilities uh, of the harm, harmful impact on our daily operations, it concerning our uh, like daily work, like operational process, our investment program. So we are trying to to balance with these difficult times in order to to be the more efficiency, more powerful, and more successful. Let's say. Uh, from other hand, I also hope that the bottom line of the crisis of the crisis is behind us and the recovery and more opportunities are ahead. So now after the 
uh, after the challenging time and the most difficult times, we are we are ready for, to 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 recover, to expand our uh, to extend our operational, to invite more and more airspace users to Ukrainian airspace, and we are we would like to to welcome yeah, all all inter interest party uh, which which can which can be handled by by our company. Uh, so I would like to. Thank you for, for the opportunity to, to, to make the welcome speech. And I would like to wish the, the Congress the success story in the future and starting from, from today and the go on. The new horizons in the scientific work, fruitful meet, uh, meetings, new good, uh, let's say, contacts. Yeah. And for Ukraine, uh, from the National Aviation University, new talented students, which we are already waiting for. And we hopeful uh, we hopefully think that everything will be good in the aviation of Ukraine and also in the worldwide. So thank you very much and have a nice congress. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mark. Thank you, Andrei, for your wonderful presentation. And of course, this is not easiest time for NS providers and for Uxats especially. And you mentioned this crisis, and uh, of course, uh, we all heard it on, out of that and. Uh, you have a very uh, difficult task to overcome that. It's all on your shoulders and uh, on your responsibility. And uh, thank you very much that you take this responsibility and uh, you, you carry that, uh, uh, I would say, successfully and uh, managing the situation in this crisis. So from the normal managers, we became the crisis managers. <laughs> and this is the, 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 the challenge in future, which I hope will be appreciated one day. So uh, I, I wish you all the best and do you all the best and uh, recover and uh, uh, to uh, be stronger or to become stronger due to this uh, uh, turbulent times. Thank you, Andre, again, and uh, have a good day. And now we continue with our INS providers. And I'm very happy to provide the floor to our colleague from our neighboring, uh, closest neighbor to, from Poland. Uh, I give the floor to Janusz Janoszewski, the president of Polish Air Navigation Service Agency. Janusz, please, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, Dimitro. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, great, really great news that I can uh, be a part of this uh, big conference, which is showing how we are now and what is the position of the transport and uh, air transport and what will be the position of the, uh, the the air transport in the future because of the COVID-19. So, Dimitro, thank you very much for the invitation and, uh, and um, thank you very much to the rest of the panelists and the participants of this uh, conference. Uh, we just have sent, uh, yesterday we sent a small presentation from the PANSA side, so if we could upload, uh, if there is no problem with those uh, technical problems, so I would like to show you a um, few uh, our thoughts about the whole situation which we are having now um, in uh, whole world, in Europe, in whole world, and uh, which is affecting us. Uh, so if, we, if I may ask for the presentation. Uh, yeah, actually, we can share. If you put a request to share the screen, we can share your screen and it will be easier. You can manage your presentation. Okay, probably I'm not able to do that. Okay, I will do it uh, without the presentation. We will just uh, uh, give you later on. Nevertheless, the few facts about the PANSA and what we are, we are the sixth largest uh, in the European Union. So we are 38 millions of population in Poland. In 2019, it was one of the best years uh, in the history of the Polish aviation and especially the commercial aviation because we, uh, we were handling almost 1 million of of IFR flights, adding to that 250, more than 250,000 VFR flights. So the PANSA, uh, oh, we see, we see, we see something. We have something. So the PANSA, uh, the PANSA just dealt uh, with almost 1 million, over 1 million of, uh, of flights uh, in the Polish airspace. So as I said, it was the one of the um, uh, best years uh, in the Polish Air Navigation Service 
Justice Agency, and we were uh, the part of the um, uh, um, uh, European growth and uh, especially Central Eastern European uh, growth uh, uh, um, in the aviation. Uh, so we are operating uh, in one ACC in Warsaw, then we are having four APPs and the 15, uh, 15 towers. Of course, 80 percent of the whole traffic is covered by the uh, ACC. And about the pandemic, if I may just ask for the next slide um, about the pandemic. Uh, I'm treating the pandemic as a um, time vehicle because in one hand, we see that the traffic drop is tremendous. Uh, the March and April was 90% uh, uh, less of the traffic comparing to the, um, uh, to the, uh, to the 2019 to that uh, the, the same time. So March and April 2019. Then we had the slightly growth of the traffic. This is the uh, based uh, on the stat for uh, presentation, the Euro control um, uh, scenarios uh, about the traffic. And we see that the traffic is still ve very, very low because we are having approximately and we'll have approximately uh, um, up to 50, 45 percent of the traffic from the uh, previous years, which causes a lot of problems uh, to the NSPs. And uh, as my colleague from Uxatz said, this is the very difficult time for all aviation organizations. But uh, uh, we need, don't, uh, we cannot, you know, just uh, put attention to the to the loss of the traffic. We have to think about the future. And if I may ask for the next slide. Um, so uh, we moved as a PANSA to two, two years, 2005, 2006. So we uh, we are in the uh, time machine where we move to the to the to, to, to the past, uh, to the traffic levels of uh, 2005, 2006, we are having now approximately the level of the traffic about 45 up to maximum 50% of the traffic from 2019. But a lot of people which were saying um, before me about, uh, which uh, were highlighting, showing the, the, the future, the challenges like Henrik, uh, like feeling the, uh, Philip, the good friends of mine, they said that this is the opportunity and this is the opportunity to come over the challenges which we had in uh, previous years. So about the carbonization, about the delays, and um, uh, about the other issues which were uh, strictly connected to the growing uh, traffic. And we in PANSA, we put, uh, we made the strategic decision to make a solutions uh, from the crisis. So if I may just ask the, for the ne next slide. Uh, and what we recognize that despite of the problems, because uh, as I said, in one hand, uh, uh, on one hand, we just moved to 2005, 2006. So we are trying to deal with this crisis. We're trying to keep our financial liquidity. We are trying to optimize our operational procedures. We need to also optimize the, process and the, 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 the working methods of the uh, operational stuff because we have to divide people into groups and we have to fulfill a lot of restrictions with which put on us uh, the, the healthcare in Poland, the healthcare in, uh, in Europe. On the other hand, we said, no, we have to go uh, go ahead. We have to go further more and we need to do something which will be required in the coming years. So we put on the investments. We treating investments as a treatment on COVID, as a vaccine uh, on COVID. That's why we said, okay, we will take a loan from the bank. We'll try to find other financing system to cover our major, major investments. And uh, uh, two good friends of mine. So as I said, Henrik and Philip were saying about the the challenges about the carbonization, about the delays, about the virtualization. We are putting as a PANSA now a, a huge efforts to implement the, uh, the requirements of the new structure, the new model of the market, which will become in the future. I'm saying about the new aviation market model. So we are trying to fulfill all the requirements of the airspace architecture study, uh, which uh, is providing us to have a um, uh, a system, as uh, technical solutions, the IT solutions, the artificial intelligence solutions to uh, to fulfill uh, to to have a scalable system, resilience the, uh, system. So we are putting now a lot of efforts to prepare the future system, uh, uh, of, uh, which will be digitalizing uh, digitalizing digitalizing uh, the uh, Polish uh, 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 Polish skies, which will 
which will give us an automation, which will give us virtualization and remotization as a solution for the challenges which we had in the past, but which we'll have also in the future. Because I do believe that the traffic will come will come back. It will be probably in the, within the two years, three years, or even four years, but we will be back on the track. We will have very soon the same level of the traffic. Maybe the traffic will change. The structure of the traffic will change, but nevertheless, we are making now, uh, we are deploying now, and we are signing the contracts which are fulfilling all the requirements of the airspace architecture study. And I will give you just two examples which are very important for the future. First is the future ATM system. We just, uh, we just signed the contract one month ago with our supplier Indra to create and then to deploy until 2024 the new uh, for uh, the new system, which is based on the 4D tra trajectory and on the I, uh, AI solutions and the cloud-based solutions. So this is called iTech version 3.0 pathfinding um, uh, system. So the solutions, which shows that uh, shows that this is the answer, not only for the COVID, but for the problems which we, which we had in 2019, 2018. And I believe that within the iTech consortium, we will be able to deploy that solution which will be created here in Poland in our new uh, center of excellence in Poznań, which is the so-called Navi Hub, so the R&D solutions for the future ATM. We will be able to create the new system, which will be answering for the requirements of the past and the requirements of the uh, of the future. And about the future, uh, if I may ask the, 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 the next slide is, uh, the solutions. So the new mean of the transportation, which will, which which is uh, just knocking to the to our doors. This is I'm saying about the unmanned traffic. So about the drones. This is the part of the innovation, but also the part of changing words. So because uh, if you uh, if you look how we are changing our habits, how the COVID is changing our habits, because we are uh, we have to now keep the social distance. We have to uh, deal with the services in the different way. So we are, for example, we are the example of changing habits because now we, in, we are in the virtual center. We are in the virtual reality. We are exchanging our views via new systems so this is the, uh, the, the 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 opportunity to create cloud-based solutions to create a big data centers and the example of such uh, big data center for unmanned traffic is the new Pansa solutions Pansa UTM this is the first in the Europe uh, operational UTM systems, which is now deployed on our 15 towers, which is dedicated for the control zones, which gives the non-verbal communication between drone pilot and the air traffic controllers, and in the future will be giving the solutions for the so, uh, for the services like the health services. For example, in between the April and May, we just uh, made the first trial, the first pilotage of uh, the um, uh, of the tra transportation of the COVID, uh, uh, um, COVID uh, um, uh, probes. Uh, so we we just uh, uh, from one hospital we moved. We uh, give the opportunity to 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 give the way to the uh, to, to the COVID probes. So we are speed upping this, uh, the the processes of the tests in the uh, 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 in the COVID situation. Then we are creating now the new solutions for the public services as a pansa. So this is the our answer for the future challenges for the changes the transformation of the transportation uh, in the Europe. So we believe uh, that, uh, of course, on one hand, the COVID is the tragic situation because we have a lot of casualties. Uh, this is the, the health problem. But uh, from the other hand, this is the problem for the worldwide markets because some 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 notes of the of the markets for some notes of the transportation like the aviation transportation is now uh, during i would say heart attack uh, or the stroke because we are losing everything what we uh, reach uh, uh, what we have reached uh, uh, since the last 50 60 60 years on the other hand this are, this is the huge challenge to make a technical improvement and this technical improvement improvement is is now is is doing we we are we are seeing that this this is 
now uh, in uh, in these times because we are starting to use other uh, other services we are starting to use other technologies so we could use what we are doing now to create the new solutions for the future and uh, I can, as I said, we are doing this. We, uh, I, I, I was uh, hearing a great speech from the ASA uh, calling about the AI and the future solutions. Now we are creating that solutions and uh, within three years, we, we will be able to deploy the solutions. I'm saying about the new ATM structure, about the new market model in the aviation, but from the perspective of the unmanned traffic, this transformation is, is, is going now and we are deploying the systems which will help the services to create the new solutions for every citizen in the world. So from my side, thank you very much. And it was a great opportunity to take a part of this conference. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to ask. I will answer via email or other uh, or, or other um, way of uh, changing information. So Dimitro, thank you very much. Mitro, just switch on your mic. Switch on your mic. Yeah, there are two ways now. It's okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Janusz, for your wonderful presentation, for your openness, for your energy, uh, which I should say that uh, um, uh, Janusz, also the chairman of the A6 Alliance of European Air Navigation Providers. And I'm very happy to see that PANSA and our good friends from PANSA are moving so. Uh, fast and uh, covering so broad a range of, of issues and the funds have become really the prominent NS provider in the region. We are in Ukraine also uh, looking forward for our continuation of our partnership as we did the consortium and uh, out of which the new technologies um, appeared. And of course, there is also issue of the cross border operations and of course the drones. The drones, uh, your, your activities and your success and development in, in, in drones is uh, uh, it's, it, it's very, uh, a very, very good example and we are applauding uh, you, the results of you do. Of course, I wish you all the best in all this direction of you, what you mentioned. And uh, of course, we, uh, we will uh, exchange the context of the all participants. So they, uh, 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 we continue the networking, of course, in the new reality. But hopefully one day we can meet together again, uh, whether in Poland or in Ukraine or in Vif, uh, uh, and uh, uh, cheer each other in a more close environment. And again, Janusz, thank you very much. And uh, we wish a big success to PANSA, to all Polish economy, and of course, to you as the president of PANSA. Thank you very much. And I will ask uh, to stay Poland online, uh, connected. And now I'm very proud to provide the floor to uh, um, uh, rector of the International University of Logistics and Transport in Wroclaw, Poland, Mr. Marcin Pawieska. The um, floor is yours, please. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I very warmly welcome everyone on this esteemed conference. It's a real privilege to be the part of it, especially considering the important and long lasting relation between our universities. International University of Logistics and Transport that I represent is the best logistics university in Poland and has a lucky number 13 out of more than 350 of such organizations in the country. And uh, we have more than 11 years old cooperation with National Aviation University, which spans across various areas and has developed and flourished over time. We have created joint Polish-Ukrainian Institute to coordinate cooperation or research between our scientists. This resulted not only and results not only in numerous publications, but also many applications and strengthened not only universities cooperation, but also industry cooperation between Poland and Ukraine in general, aviation and in particular in uh, drone technology. We have achieved program uniformity between our universities and at present we have two plus two joint master's degree. Thanks to deep expertise of National Aviation University in aviation, we have created together with National Aviation University, innovative program on aviation logistics, first of its kind in Poland, which looks at logistics in this important sector. And Polish government 
seeing the lack of such program has certified and further funded working on it. It has been enthusiastically and warmly welcomed by aviation industry, both in European Union and Ukraine, which has been at forefront of supporting it. We are now creating together with National Aviation University fully online master degree, first of its kind uh, that will allow to provide knowledge to students across the entire world, an innovative formula so much needed and required in current COVID era. Finally, just two days ago, I have learned that we have won yet another project of joint collaboration, which will support the inflow of students from all around the world to our joint program. For 11 years, we have worked together to create the knowledge and expand the didactic and didactic offer of both institutions and scientific potential. And given the achievements so far, I very much look forward to a long and lasting cooperation with such an important partner as National Aviation University. I wish you all the success in the Congress and I'm delighted to be the part of this important conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcin, for your, uh, for your wonderful presentation. And of course, uh, the cooperation with the new universities is uh, very important. And uh, in, the, in the new era, era of uh, COVID, you come to the uh, online, uh, uh, online programs and uh, uh, hopefully with the new technology, we don't, don't need to move physically, but work as the same uh, unit and the same entity. And uh, again, thank you very much for your uh, wonderful uh, presentation and for your patience. And I wish all the best to the Wroclaw University. And uh, now I would like to uh, provide the floor to our friend from Portugal, uh, Luis Manuel Braga de Costa Campos, professor of Department of Mechanical Engineers, Instituto Superior Tecnico Portugal. Uh, please, uh, Professor, uh, campus floor is yours. Good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen. I, I would like to share the screen if it's possible. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, I'll make. Uh, are you seeing? Are you seeing the screen? Is it being shared? Ah, okay. Um, so I'll make a, a brief introduction to the project PAR: Perspectives for Aerospace Research in Europe, and then make a few comments about the comparison between the pre and post COVID situation. So the project. Uh, involves 15 partners in nine countries. Uh, the main motivation is the following. As you know, the European Union has supported aeronautical research uh, program since the year 2000 in framework program two and up to framework program seven with a budget of 4 billion. The European Commission is advised on the preparation of the aeronautics research program by ACAR, Advisory Council for Aeronautical Research in Europe. Uh, which has membership from, uh, uh, from industry, research, academy operators. ACAR has produced a document entitled Slide Pass 2050, setting 23 ACAR goals for aviation to be attained by 2050. The PAR project, Perspectives for Aerospace Research in Europe, is a coordination and support action the main objective is to assess the progress towards the 23 ACAR goals, the gap remaining, and the measures appropriate to achieve those objectives. Uh, so the PAR project takes a broad look at perspectives for aviation in Europe in the next three dec decades. Now, what is the methodology to, to assess the progress towards ACAR goals? So we take 2010 as the reference, uh, we collect relevant statistics up to the present year, so 20 years. Then we predict the evolution, say, up to 2030. 
and then we extrapolate to 2050. And then we find if there is a gap. If there is a gap, we see how that gap could be closed by accelerated continuous development, by a timely step change, which would mean new technology or a combination of the two. Now, the results of the project are uh, presented in yearly reports. Um, the, for, uh, the, uh, the, report has, the reports have 20 chapters. The first part um, of the report is the assessment of the progress towards the 23R car goals. They are grouped, they are put in five groups, um, like in the flight pass document. So the five groups are meeting societal and market needs, maintaining and extending industrial leadership, protecting the environment and the energy supply, ensuring safety and security, and prioritizing research, testing capabilities, and education. Now, the part two, uh, defines 35 PAR objectives, which support the achievement of 23R CAR goals. Uh, I mentioned that there is a PAR session at this Congress with six presentations, which correspond to six of the 20 chapters of the PAR report. So chapter seven is long range air transport. Chapter eight is emerging technologies relevant to aviation. This will be paper six in the PAR session. Chapter nine, cooperation beyond Europe borders then attracting young talent to aeronautics and improving the gender balance. These are papers four and three and four in the session. Now, the POR project has formulated 35 PAR objectives supporting the achievement of the 23R CAR goals. And together they form a set of 58 recommendations for aeronautic research in Europe. Now, the third part of the report contains detailed case studies of major issues some of them emerged after the start of the project. The project started in 2017, so D737 marks the COVID-19, and some have gained recently more importance, the new Green Deal for environmental friendly aviation. So the part three covers two case studies, um, evolution of Chinese aircraft industry, the prospects for the Boeing middle of the market aircraft. Then, recent subjects, the two Boeing 737 MAX accidents and consequences, regional and international air travel, the effects of COVID-19 on aviation, uh, technologies for low noise and emissions, this is paper five in par session, decarbonization of aviation by 2050, and alternative sustainable fuels. Then there is a conclusion and set of articles. Uh, these articles um, are written for the general public and summarized for the general public. So from all this, uh, I'll mention briefly three topics. First, the 58 recommendations for aeronautics research in Europe. Then the tech, 10 technologies um, relevant, emerging technologies relevant to aviation. And then the pre versus post to COVID-19 situation in aviation. Now, uh, the 58 recommendations uh, for aeronautics research in Horizon Europe, so the forthcoming program, collect together 23R car goals and 35 PAR objectives. They have a similar structure. First is a statement of the car goal or PAR objective, then the recommendation itself, brief statement of the actions to be taken, then a rationale, the motivation based on current and future situation, then the stakeholders, the potential contributors to the action needed, from the member states, industry, academia, and so on, the relevance, the potential impact of the initiative, priority. We assign priorities on a scale from one to four, and then a justification is found in more detail in the PAR report. So I give an example of an cargo. The European air transport system operates seamlessly through interoperable and network systems, allowing manned and unmanned vehicles to safely operate in the same airspace. So this is the matter of drone integration in manned airspace. The first recommendation is assess the evolution of air traffic in Europe compared, uh, cap, uh, 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 assess the evolution of air traffic capacity in Europe compared with the growth of transport when we've identified spare capacity for other users like drones. That has a one star priority, establish a qualification required 
of operators of UAVs and other aircraft compared with airline pilots and air traffic controllers to ensure that aviation remains the safest mode of transportation. Third recommendation, define the design, production, certification, and maintenance procedures for UAVs and other aircraft to preserve or improve safety of current airliners operating in the same airspace. And then another recommendation, explore the increased use of partially underused airspace to enable expansion of operation for new types of aircraft. Uh, the rationale is that air traffic capacity needs to increase to keep up with growth of air transport. Now we have COVID-19. Uh, the operation of UAV in manned airspace will require additional capacity within the total available. The record of aviation as safest mode of transport is based on highest engineering standards and professional qualifications as regards aircraft and cannot be compromised for UAVs operating in the same Mars airspace. The use of partially unused airspace could provide testing area and additional capacity for UAVs to prove at least equal to manned aircraft in terms of safety, which is not quite safe as at present. So this is just one example of recommendation. Another example is the 10 emerging technologies relevant to aviation. We, these we have considered our proposal, solar, battery, fuel cell, electric, hybrid, and also don't forget the development potential of thermal, sustainable fuels and hydrogen, so as options for regional, short, medium, and long-range aircraft, additive manufacturing, the advantages, limitations, and potential, efficient production 4.0, learning and adapting from large-scale production in other sectors, telecommunications, exploiting higher frequency bands with larger bandwidths and data rates, cybersecurity, ensuring security in increasing op increasingly open architectures and countering intrusions, Big data, exploit vast amounts of sensor and monitoring data for own condition and preventing maintenance and uh, improving operations and design. Artificial intelligence, using big data for learning processes of artificial intelligence and its domain of safe application and risks. New materials, lightweight structures, high temperatures and stresses, special conditions nanotechnologies and nanotube structures, micromechanical devices, morphing technologies, and mostly hollow uh, stiff structures. Now, the third point I would mention briefly is comparison of aviation pre and post COVID. As, as mentioned before, it's the biggest crisis in the history of aviation, and it affects all sectors. It affects airline services, leasing companies, aircraft industry, Engine manufacturing. Louis, sorry, uh, your, your slide doesn't move. If you can move it from you, because we only have the first slide and uh, uh, we, we ah. see it in the left side, and that's all. Ah. Okay, sorry. No, um, I, I don't understand. Sorry. And, uh, the, the, you, your slides, uh, we see only your first slide and uh, uh, you please uh, move it uh, from yourself because we cannot do that. Ah. Oh well, yeah. Now, now it's okay. Yeah. Ah, okay. It's okay. Okay. So, um, so the 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 COVID nineteen crisis, I was saying, affects every sector: airline services, leasing companies, aircraft industry, engine manufacturers, supply chain maintenance repair and overhaul, used aircraft market, airports, air navigation service providers, business aviation, and research and development. Now, airline services. Before COVID-19, as you know, we had one of the longest boom periods of sustained growth in the history of aviation, large backlogs of aircraft on order and on lease. After sharp decline in passenger demand due to confinement, Half of the fleet is grounded, parked or stored. Older, less efficient, more polluting aircraft will be retired. Only the most modern aircraft are sustainable economically and meet increasingly stringent environmental uh, uh, legislation. In order to try to recover, airlines fly about 80% of the route to try to keep uh, as much as possible. Of lower 
passenger Airbus demand. They operate smaller aircraft on selected schedules to uh, 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 achieve acceptable load factors. They try to collect, uh, attract passengers with low fares, as, as low as economics are low. They try to reassure passengers about health, uh, health risks. But the, the, the recovery depends very much on coordinated deconfinement, and this is most difficult for long haul. Now, leasing companies is an interesting story. They grew from 4% of the world market fleet in 1980 and are now about three, one third of the world aircraft fleet. They had strong demand before COVID-19 increased by the grounding of 737 MAX. Also, there were the traditional private Western lessers aiming for profit, but recently uh, what was called excessive competition from state subsidized Chinese lessers, which aim to increase their market share with unbeatable prices. Now, post COVID-19, with half the fleet grounded, airlines favor the most e efficient aircraft. And since some of them are leased, they are still interested in leased aircraft. The lessers try to keep airline customers and they allow deferred payments three to seven months and repayments about 12 months later. And this helped them survive. Now they have a positive cash flow and as airlines make repayments and less airlines make late payments. So they, they do creative wheels and was an example of survival. Engine manufacturers. Before COVID-19, they were struggling to deliver enough engines due to limit production capacity. This was not helped by the in-service problems with the new generation of engines. Also note, uh, engines have strong revenues from sales. It's about one third. And overhaul and maintenance of engines is two thirds of the revenue. So uh, post COVID, so the uh, post COVID production, um, cut, there were production cuts of 30% in, in, in engines as for airliners, but there were big cuts in maintenance due to reduced flight hours. All cash threat airlines postponed major overhauls. So the engine sector had cuts of 50% larger than aircraft manufacturers. Then supply chain. Before COVID-19, Airbus and Boeing competition had forced suppliers to reduce profit margins between, below 10%. Then there was a big production ramp up, which induced suppliers to take bank loans to increase capacity. And suppliers were already in weak economic position because they had bank debts and low profits. Then after COVID, there was a sharp, break, sharp breakdown in orders, uh, which was un unsustainable with the economic condition they had. So some suppliers less dependent on civil aircraft, such as defense, other sectors are better able to survive. Some suppliers may leave the aircraft sector, either bankrupt or go to other sectors where they are better off. The suppliers of essential hardware have to be supported to enable eventual recovery. So Airbus and Boeing are support, supporting some of them. Non-essential service suppliers may be dropped since up the tires have too much stuff and too little work and will not subcontract. Um, consolidation of supply chain is going to happen and production may shift to the lowest rate that is economically sustainable. Now, maintenance, repair and overhaul. Before COVID-19, it was a boom in demand in line with passenger demand and large airline fleets and the original equipment uh, manufacturers were struggling to meet the demand for new aircraft and were not interested in aftermarket. Post COVID-19, uh, oh. we had a sharp decline in maintenance, repair and overhaul due to less flying and postponing of costly major services. OEMs with less orders for new aircraft and excess staffing capacity are interested in aftermarket, aftermarket and OEMs have some technical advantages with regard to new spare parts. Now, used aircraft market before COVID-19, fairly active with large belt blocks of new aircraft, sending earlier models to used market. Uh, used aircraft are less attractive because of economics and environmental legislation. 
and value of used aircraft is strongly dependent on engine parts that can be reused. Post COVID-19, up to 20 or 30% of the airline fleets will be disposed of permanently, flooding the market and lowering values. Uh, Luis Campos, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, it's Olga from Administrative. Uh, we are um, glad to hear you, but uh, can we make a um, point uh, to give the speech to our next uh, speaker? Okay, okay. Uh, okay. Uh -huh. uh, well, I'll stop here. Okay. Uh, we can continue after or download your presentation on no. our website. No, okay, we finish, yeah, okay. I don't want to exceed my time. I'm sorry so much. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, Luis, uh, then we'll provide the floor to our colleague from Turkey because he needs uh, to, to rush and then we continue with you. Thank you very much for understanding. Obrigado, and uh, we will continue for sure. Please stay connected. Thank you. And uh, now I will, I'm happy to provide the floor uh, to uh, Dr. Hikmet Karakos, Professor of Aviation Faculty at uh, Eski Shahir Technical University and Director of Civil Aviation Research and Application Center and President of the International Sustainable Aviation and Energy Research Society. Dr. Hikmet Karakos, please, floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, dear Rector, dear speakers, dear participants, I would like to thank you for inviting me as a speaker uh, in the plenary session. Especially, especially I would like to uh, thank Rector Professor Isyanko Volodymyr Mikhailovich, Vice Rector Professor Alexander Zaporizhets, Vice Rector Volodymyr Karshenko, and Dean Professor Sergei Boychenko for cooperation with us. I would like to give some information about International Sustainable Aviation Energy and Research Society, SARES. SARES was founded in 2015. Sustainable aviation means to develop efficient, environmentally friendly technologies in aviation and related fields, and to ensure continuity in time varying conditions. SARES is an interdisciplinary initiative for aviation research. In this scope, in innovative research for the aviation industry, airport management tools and systems, aircraft technology management and operation, operations research. Sustainable challenges become a hot and recent problems in aviation. Environmental problems and the effect of global warming, environment and economic concerns problems arising from fossil fuels, alternative and renewable energy sources should be substituted for fossil fuels, new and innovative technologies should be developed. For safety and technical reasons, the work in this area must be accelerated so that research and industrial use of alternative and renewable energy becomes feasible. For this reason, alternative and renewable energy sources should be sought and used instead of fossil fuels. As it known, aviation is a rapidly developing sector and significant amount of energy consumed in the sector. The aviation sector must also reduce the environmental damage caused by fossil fuels used as energy sources. For this reason, aviation needs to comprehensive research and studies on new technologies, environmental impacts, economic and sustainability. As a result of these evaluations, the Sustainable Aviation Research Society was established in 2015. Our vision, SARES contribute, contributes to education, innovative work and technology transfer activities in aviation sector with a sustainability perspective at national and international level. Main objectives of SARES are researching on sustainable aviation topics, supporting institutions and affiliations associated with sustainable aviation, 
providing documentation and information about sustainable aviation, publishing journals, books, and so on related to sustainable aviation. As such, as we are publishing an international journal named International Journal of Science and Technology. It just covers aviation issues. We are waiting for your quality papers for our journal, IJAS. As far as we are publishing sustainable aviation books every year after every symposium. Up to now, SARES published three books with Springer. I am honored to announce that the whole a while ago, we signed a contract with Springer. According to this contract, we are going to publish 26 books in, uh, in next years. Science gives every year six important awards. Lifetime Achievement, Science Award, Young Scientist Award, Graduate Award, the Company Award, uh, lastly, the Young, Young Researcher Award. This year, SARS, SARS Awards will, will be given International Symposium on Sustainable Aviation on 9th to 12th November. We are waiting your nominates for the awards. I would like to introduce you to new organization shame of SARS. You would like to open SARS branches in different countries. The current SARS organization will continue to be SARS International as well as I will also establish SARS Turkey. The International Board of SARS has currently been updated. The current uh, list of SARS board can be seen in the slide. From now, we will manage the SARS uh, together with these members. SARES organizes three symposiums and a course every year. These are International Symposium on Sustainable Aviation, International Symposium on Electric Aviation and Autonomous Systems, International Symposium on Aircraft Technology and Moran Operations, International Course on Unmanned Aerial Vehicle. Actually, we plan to organize these symposiums at now, now National Aviation University Kiev face to face uh, today because of the COVID. We changed the symposium online via Zoom. ICAS Tveni, ISATEC Tveni, and ICUAV Tveni symposium will start with opening concert today, 1 p.m., uh, appro approximately 30 minutes later. The host of the symposium, National Aviation University Director, uh, Professor Isyanko Volodymyr Mikhailovich will also give an opening speech. I invite all of you to this symposium, which will start uh, in about uh, uh, 30 minutes later. In the last some photos from uh, my hometown city, uh, I would like to share uh, that uh, photos after uh, after that, I am planning to organize uh, one of the, our symposium in Eskisher with Eskisher Technical University. Now you can see some uh, photos. Uh, my hometown uh, Eskisher. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoy the Congress. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much for your uh, interesting introduction of and the uh, interesting information about the platform, which is uh, really the worldwide platform. And uh, we wish you a great success. And of course, with the new challenges uh, uh, to be even more um, recognizable for all the uh, stakeholders. And uh, uh, thank you again for sharing your, uh, the nice pictures of your motherland and your native lands. And now I would like to continue with our Turkish uh, uh, stakeholders, take the Turkish uh, participants. I would like to provide the floor to Mr. Haider Atesh, the uh, UAV main project and UAV training in Turkey, assistant professor 
uh, at uh, Turkish uh, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, cha uh, Turkey chapter president. Uh, I, I couldn't uh, really understand it, this abbreviation, W-U-A-A-V-F, whatever it is, but please, uh, Mr. Atesh, the floor is yours. Uh, Mr. Ates, can you hear me? Uh, switch on your microphone, please. Left below in the screen, please. Professor, can you switch on your mic, please, in your screen? We cannot hear you. Can you hear us? We cannot hear you, unfortunately. Okay, did you hear me? Oh, now it's wonderful. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Music technique is better. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me for this important conference. I am uh, Dr. Haydar Ateş, uh, Turkey chapter president of World UAV Federation. And uh, this meeting is very important because aviation sector is getting important, especially this pandemic crisis, actually, uh, so does uh, aviation is getting important for the world, especially uh, including the logistics, air cargo is getting more and more important and the growing sector, the most growing sector in the world. I will give some brief information about Turkish UAV project. Uh, I am following those because of time limitation, some main projects, important projects. Okay, I am sharing my presentation. I think you can see. Uh, my expertise are logistics, aviation and education management. I will give information about the main projects, UAV projects and the training in Turkey. One of the important projects is Aksungur. UAV-3 projects completed all tests and will be in the service soon. Total weight is 3.3 tons, includes 750 kilogram payload. There are two engines, uh, 170 HP engine, turbo diesel, and other uh, information on the screen. But service steering is important. Uh, Endurance hour, 24 hours, and total service ceiling is, sorry, 35,000 feet. Anka is another project. Uh, can uh, you share your screen, please? I already did again. Let me try again. Okay. Uh, no, try again, please. Okay. And, Did you see? and choose presentation. Okay. Please. Did you see? Yeah. Okay, right now? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Let me from beginning from this one. Aksungur is the latest UAV-3 projects completed all tests uh, recently. And total weight 3.3 tons and includes 750 kilogram payload. Two engines, turbo diesel, and service ceiling is 35,000 feet. Endurance right now, 24 hours. You can see other uh, characteristics on the screen. Important thing is uh, there is automatic takeoff and landing system, flight control system, and encrypted data link. 
Anka is another one. Anka, advanced medium altitude, long endurance, uh, UAV system, performance day and night, and can serve all weather reconnaissance, provide target detection, identification, and intelligence missions with its EO, IR, and SAR payloads. There is autonomous flight capability and automatic takeoff and landing capability. Wingspan 17 meters, service ceiling 10,000 meters. And endurance is 24 hours, data range 200 kilometers. Day and night, all weather ISR mission capabilities with payloads and fixed or moving target tracking capability, ATC radio relay over data link, onboard data recording capability, and expansion capabilities, including SETCOM, SIGING, and communications relay, and remote video terminal option. And other information on the screen, generally working all systems are dual redundant system. And important thing is there is electro expulsive ice protection system uh, because of high altitude service mission. There are two other versions, B and C. Uh, there is electro optic camera, assets and production, Turkish company, the weight, Anka S five tons and uh, B 1.5 ton, payload Anka S one ton, and automatic takeoff, landing, and day and night service capability. And there is SETCOM capability and sending HD video to receiver in 200 kilometers range. Bayraktar is another one uh, which can operate over seven kilometers for 24 hours, has a fully automatic control system and three redundant autopilot systems, fully automatic takeoff and landing with no GPS dependence. This one is very important. Built in sensor fusion and navigation. The weapons are laser guided anti tank missile and smart missile. Kyle is another one. Service ceiling seven kilometer. Payload is less, 70 kilogram. And mission right relation endurance 20 hours. And surveillance system sending data up to 210 kilometers to ground station. And there is electro optic camera with laser pointer. Bayraktar TB2, the recent projects about this site, altitude records 27,000 feet, flight duration endurance 24 hours. And there is command and control system produced in Turkey. And another one is mini UAV. This one has automatic waypoint navigation, secure digital communication, home return and automatic landing in case of loss communication, multi UAV support, smart battery management system, and remote range command control and monitor, and ground control switching capability. The last project completed all tests at 29 of March, and the uh, last flight test completed 1st of September. Uh, about 20 days ago, Akınca, main mission is Submarine Hunter. Service ceiling is 40,000 feet, weight is five tons. Payload plant as 900 kilograms, but during the test, uh, it could be seen that uh, total payload, one ton, 350 kilograms. Endurance plant as 24 hours. But last flight in September 1st, uh, total endurance time, 49 hours. And there is double engine from T, the company in Eskişehir. Professor uh, Hikmet mentioned about the city. That city is very important for us. There are five poles, SETCOM capability, and wingspan is 20 meter. Charta is another one, general police uh, system using this important UAV for the service uh, internal security system. Another important project from TAE, located in Eskişehir also, they are working on turboshaft engine 
to use on UAV systems, even on small aircrafts, such as training aircrafts. There is laboratory and UAV research and development center. There are some other centers, but this one is the biggest one in Ankara. Another important issue is UAV pilot training. As you know, there are four levels UAVs, zero, one, two, and three. And for UAV zone, uh, for UAV zero, there are 12 hours of theoretical course and one hour flight training. UAV one, 36 hours theoretical course and one hour flight training. UAV two, 90 hours theoretical course and 36 hours of flight training. For UAV three, generally military users and security forces using this kind of UAVs. And the weight is 150 kilogram and above. Up to now, the highest one, five tons. Total 150 hours of theoretical course and 44 hours of flight training. The topics generally introduction to UAV, the air law, especially UAV law, principles of flight, methodology, communication, navigation, avionic and propulsion, and maintenance. UAV pilot training center also is Eskisehir in order. Uh, there is permanent mountain area that was a radius of nine kilometers, two grass runways, 900 and 1200 meters. It is possible to use for UAV, glider, parachuting, paragliding, sailing wing purposes. There is a, a accommodation, 150 beds, dining hall, and cafeterias in that area in a shape. This one, UAV pilot training center. I want to show small UAVs uh, to give some idea about this center. All training in the center uh, actually are free of charge.
this is end of my presentation. If you have any question, you can see my email on the screen or WhatsApp or WeChat account. Thank you, Professor Atesh. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, we congratulate you on the wonderful results and uh, uh, very interesting um, um, uh, it, 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 cooperation with the industry. And uh, really, uh, it's, uh, it's impressive, these uh, types of uh, aircraft the, we should done. And of course, we are very interested to share with you uh, your experiences in training and the different types of training for the UAV, because that also should be regulated on a national basis. And uh, of course, you, all your uh, uh, all your uh, elaboration it would be very interesting to share. So for, we definitely, we will contact you for the further uh, communication. And uh, because we uh, we have so many UAV and Airpass uh, issues in the plenary session, so we cancel the uh, dedicated drone session. But uh, we will organize definitely the webinar devoted to drones, and you all will be invited for them. For this webinar in the nearest future. Thank you, Professor, again, and have a good day. And now I would like. Thank you very much. Yeah. To all organizing committee, especially the director, we met in China, and uh, when I visited to now uh, last year, I hope we will meet again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, our next speaker will be uh, Director General for uh, Civil Aviation Authority of Moldova our old friend, uh, friend, Mr. Yevgeny Koshte. And uh, I would like to ask all speakers uh, to be as uh, short as possible because we have uh, time limits in, 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 this, uh, in our online services. Uh, normally it's one o'clock, we could be a little bit later, but uh, uh, anyway, I we have a few more speakers ahead. So I would like uh, to ask everyone to be as uh, uh, compact as possible. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Koshte, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, I am pleased to take part in this Congress along with the key persons and influencers of the contemporary civilization world. Um, the new realities of the pandemic situation call not only upon the effective measures to counter the negative effect of it, but also to show the adherence of the, uh, to the continuity of the, all the important civilization activities. Today, as never before, uh, we need to learn the lessons of history and to keep focused on the challenges which are and will be part of aviation in the years to come. Uh, in this context, actually, I'd like um, to make a presentation of uh, some historical markers of the unmanned aircraft systems. Um, and as uh, my previous colleagues and uh, speakers just already touched this issue, and I think I'll be very perfect on, on the track, uh, just to give uh, some uh, from, let's say, uh, historical use and regulatory uh, perspective. I'll try to, um, to share the, the screen uh, very quick. Uh, do you see it? Dmitro, please, can you confirm that you see my screen? Yes, uh, we can see your screen. Okay, yes. okay. So it's okay. Thank you. So uh, I'll be as short as possible uh, presenting this uh, the presentation. It's well known that uh, science is uh, constantly evolving and the emergence of new technologies is taking place at an unimaginable spree. We not notice how project that a few decades ago seems to be detached from science fiction films become reality. But some technologies which are considered to be a modern air emergency labeled in aviation as the new entrance are proved to have a deep historical roots which shows the lines for their future developments. One of the best examples is drones. The, uh, the devices associated nowadays primarily with the aviation world began uh, their history more out of the water than airborne. It dates back to the late 19th century when Nikola Tesla built and demonstrated the first radio controlled mini ship. Uh, Dr. Eugen Kastei, can you switch on your presentation on full screen, please? Uh, yeah, 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 I'll do it. Just a second, please. Uh, 
yeah, you can it. press the bottom. Uh -huh. Thanks. So, um, uh, and, and uh, this presentation of uh, mediaship didn't go uh, unnoticed by scientists at the time, which was uh, the first step in the further development of remote control technologies. But of course, we can we cannot uh, go just without um, 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 seeing that uh, the first so-called unmanned uh, hot air balloon was launched by brothers Mandelfier at Versailles in France uh, back in 1783. Um, Tesla wrote in his drone patent uh, that unmanned vehicles would bring world peace throughout mutually assured destruction. Those worlds of Tesla had a lot of reason behind. Uh, while we generally understand that uh, an unmanned aircraft or ship uh, to be guided by remote control or on board computers, the military histories showed use the unmanned machine for the purpose of war. Back in 1849, when Austria attacked Venice using unmanned balloons started with explosives. Austrian forces uh, who were besieging Venice at the time launched around 200 of these incendiary balloons over the city without being a huge success. At the time, the attack remains uh, the kind of prototype for the modern military use of drones. Um, early development of this uh, technology appeared in 1907 when brother Jacques and Louis Breguet, uh, with help of French uh, psychologist Professor Charles Lichet, developed an early example of the gyroplane. And again, the development went in parallel for civil and military use as uh, Charles Kettering of uh, US Army built the Kettering Bug, which used uh, gyroscopic controls and was intended to be used as an aerial torpedo. Uh, here, uh, probably remember the Queen Bee, the first returnable and reusable drone that was designed for aerial, as an aerial target during uh, training missions. And from that time to, until 2000s, the military use of, of UAS uh, surpassed the civil one. Uh, so uh, what are lessons learned from, uh, from the history? That, uh, first, the development of the civil and military technologies uh, in UAS will continue to go by hand by hand. Um, so drones can be used in different activities. Uh, almost all airspaces are involved uh, while they use drones. Uh, this is uh, new technologies and the, the big field test for, for, the, for the testing of the technologies. We uh, know that uh, drones are used by various users. Uh, of course, we are focused now on safety. Uh, there is something uh, that we have to draw the lines for to do, and we can, or it's like we can or cannot. Uh, so making a room for drones, this is a use space concept I'm going to touch uh, further. And uh, of course, uh, it's harmonization of international approach, uh, as uh, uh, states approaching. So uh, CESAR, CESAR 2020 uh, have, uh, has two projects for U space. It's Podium and Chorus. Podium uh, supporting U space with the European vision for the safe, secure, and efficient handling of drone traffic, and a key enable for the growing drone market to generate economic and social benefits. And Chorus seeks to develop a concept of operation of U space, which first enables a wide range of UAS users will accommodate the level of traffic today and uh, that expect in the future, takes on board the best ideas from around the world and is accepted by a wide range of stakeholders. Uh, what's happening in uh, UAS regulations? So, uh, first is uh, that registration of UAS operators and certified drones become mandatory as of 31st of December, 2020. Um, as operation is uh, in specific category may be conducted after the authorization given by the national aviation authorities. All operations uh, in the open category will be conducted according to the EU regulation as of 1st January 2023. Introduction of national rules uh, on prohibited areas, restricted areas and dangerous, danger areas uh, according to national responsibility. Uh, and. Uh, the Republic of Moldova in this pers perspective 
uh, is in the process of transponding the Aki commentary in the field of uh, UA as being already in the final stage of drafting the government and decision transporting EU regulation 945 and 947 uh, slash 2019. By implementing this regulation, optimal conditions will be created for the development of the extremely important sector, introducing new re requirements for certification of, uh, of uh, drones, uh, certification of operators, certification of training centers, operational activities, protection of personal data, ensuring uh, the safety of flights, and of course, the product safety. Uh, so finally, uh, I can touch that, uh, that the regulations and what the civil aviation and, and, and all other um, regulatory bodies doing is that first uh, within the Europe, uh, I mean the European territory, so uh, regulations should be shaped with, uh, within three years to come. Uh, regulations uh, have to accommodate and reflect uh, constant growth uh, on, draw, on drones. Regulations have to be flexible enough to react on future developments. I mean, uh, so they uh, have to um, to, put, uh, to to give some room for uh, development during this three-year period, and not only. And of course, uh, the regulation should be as simple as possible, especially taking into consideration that the operators are not um, s uh, having specific uh, um, education in aviation. So uh, the, the regular the public needs to understand those rules. Uh, so it's a short presentation. Thank you very much for attention. I wish all of you really good uh, deliberators and uh, fruitful discussions and pass the floor to, my, to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you all, Mitro. Thank you very much, Evgeny, for a wonderful presentation. And uh, it's very interesting to see the view of you as a chairman of CAA and such deep knowledge in the uh, UAV process and how to be regulated. Of course, there is a problem in our countries, at least we are not under IASA. So to develop national legislation and regulations for the AirPass UAV uh, 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 certification oversight and operations. And of course, uh, we'll be very uh, gladly to share with you or if you share with us your experience of the key, a key community and other things. And I think we can uh, have a joint, uh, joint uh, group to do this. As, and as I told you, we already agreed to have a dedicated webinar or conference related to drones also in the online mode. And uh, of course, uh, you will be most than wel welcome uh, to, to participate. And thank you again uh, for Indeed. the wonderful presentation and for your patience. Uh, now uh, we are again out, out of our schedule, so we'll, uh, uh, on the request of Professor Vincenzo Puri, the, uh, uh, the uh, Department of Computer Science, University of Milan, uh, uh, I will uh, give Professor Puri the, uh, Puri the uh, floor for, to provide us the uh, message and uh, presentation about artificial intelligence for aviation. Professor, floor is yours, and I'm sorry to remind you about the uh, compact presentation. Thank you. Uh, no, uh, that, no, no, uh, Professor, that we don't, we cannot hear you. Please, uh, we, uh, we see the uh, your presentation. If you can do it on the full screen, but uh, we cannot hear you, unfortunately. Still, uh, no, uh, we don't have your voice. Professor Puri, can you hear us, Vincenzo?
professor. So, Professor Fury, sorry, we, uh, uh, we we will switch to our other. Uh, Try again, we, we can see you, our technicians can see you and uh, try again. We, we, we hear some noise. Yeah, can you talk, can you say something? Can you hear me? Yeah, now it's fine, now it's good. Yes. Sorry, I don't know what's happened, I apologize. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is really a great pleasure to me uh, be with you this morning and talk about uh, some aspects of the use of artificial intelligence uh, in aviation. Uh, this, uh, there are several technological needs uh, uh, in uh, uh, our area of application uh, as uh, accuracy is concerned, uh, knowledge extraction, behavior understanding, uh, adaptability, flexibility, various decision support opportunities, uh, autonomy, safety, dependability for our system, as well as uh, security and training. Uh, in uh, particular, these uh, uh, needs uh, are uh, very strong uh, in uh, aircraft and flight control, as well as in navigation to support uh, better decision of the pilots uh, uh, by considering many more information in a concise way, as well as uh, to support uh, uh, more safety and efficiency in uh, autopilots. There is uh, also a great need of adaptivity and accuracy, as well as in uh, automatic knowledge extraction in uh, the area of airport security to support identification of persons and uh, for a better baggage screening to support uh, more informed decision to the personnel, as well as in uh, traffic management and in managing uh, the, uh, the uh, ground and in services in order to speed up uh, all activities and ensure as uh, a, a seamless uh, traffic uh, as possible. On the other side, uh, there is a great need of uh, uh, intelligent systems to increase uh, the accuracy and uh, the uh, effectiveness of the operation in uh, manufacturing, uh, in the manufacturing industry for uh, aviation, as well as in all automatic uh, uh, tasks uh, in uh, diagnostics and maintenance, as well as in uh, the support uh, for a better decision for uh, the personnel of uh, maintenance. There is also a need uh, in uh, the perspective of the customer, for example, in assistance, in uh, providing information with the chatbot in interacting in a more friendly way to customers, as well as in uh, uh, analyzing the traffic and uh, being able to predict the delays and ensure a, most, a more efficient uh, dynamic pricing uh, so that uh, we can better serve the customers uh, while uh, ensuring uh, sufficient uh, uh, revenue for uh, the company. Another important aspect in which artificial intelligence can be valuable is uh, the training of the personnel, both uh, pilots, uh, the ground personnel, and the maintenance staff. Finally, uh, a very emerging area is in uh, the area of unmanned autonomous vehicles uh, for a broad variety of applications, both uh, the individual vehicles as well as a fleet of vehicles uh, that uh, can cooperate together. In this case, uh, it is uh, very important to be able to have uh, autonomous capability of analyzing the situations and take appropriate decision. Artificial intelligence can be really effective in this perspective. First of all, uh, with uh, neural networks uh, uh, to and uh, deep learning uh, in order to be able to mimic the behavior of the brain. Uh, in analyzing and solving uh, complex systems, as well as uh, the area of uh, the technologies like fuzzy systems, which can be used to uh, describe with uh, um, expressions which are more similar to natural language 
the problem and the, the desired constraint uh, to find a most effective solution. On, finally, uh, the area of evolutionary computing uh, provides uh, many opportunities for uh, uh, creating uh, optimized solutions by mimicking the natural evolution uh, that we see uh, in the species. And uh, then we have a machine learning and many other techniques uh, which really can be useful to create uh, evolvable and intelligent systems. These technologies can be used in uh, a broad variety of aspects uh, in uh, applications, from uh, signal and image acquisition uh, to signal and image preprocessing for uh, removing noise and extract features, uh, for uh, data fusion to create a comprehensive view of uh, the environment uh, that we are analyzing. Uh, classification and quality measurement are also very important aspects uh, that can be dealt with uh, artificial intelligence, as well as uh, control, uh, support, decision support, and system optimization. In all these aspects, artificial intelligence really can provide uh, additional tools uh, to achieve uh, a better accuracy, more flexibility, more adaptivity, to better extract the knowledge from the real data. And for this reason, artificial intelligence uh, can, be, uh, can provide a set of effective solutions, uh, efficient, adaptable, uh, to design uh, the smart aviation of the near and uh, the uh, longer term future. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for your very interesting presentation. And uh, of course, artificial intelligence, the future, the future which uh, comes. And uh, yeah, there are multiple applications and uh, anal analysis of the big data. And uh, um, it, it's very important, especially in the, uh, when a drone and the mass drone applications, when they, they, they fly. Uh, 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 the uh, uh, missions with the thousands of units, of course, the artificial intelligence is essential. It couldn't be done manually or with the traditional methods of uh, traffic or movement control. And uh, again, thank you very much. And uh, of course, uh, we continue our joint work and the scientific research on this direction. Now I would like uh, to provide the floor to uh, a professor of air and space law from Beihang University, China, uh, Mr. Fabio Troncetti, who will also talk on the behalf of uh, uh, his Chinese colleagues. Uh, uh, and uh, Professor Troncetti, please, floor is yours. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening for me here in China. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. And I thank you also on behalf of Professor Liu for the opportunity to give a speech. So let me share my uh, screen. Can you see my screen? Yes? Okay. So um, essentially the, the presentation is an opportunity to give you a very brief uh, introduction of an idea that myself and Professor Liu have elaborated, uh, which goes by the name of the exclusive uh, utilization uh, space. Um, Essentially, what uh, exclusive utilization space or EUS is, is a proposed uh, new categorization of the near space uh, for the purpose of promoting economic activities therein. Before uh, giving you a little bit uh, more information of what we mean by EOS and why we came up with such a proposal, uh, let me give you uh, a couple of uh, definitions. Uh, first of all, what do we mean by near space? Now, near space is usually referred as the area which is comprised between 20 to 100 kilometers of altitude, an area which is largely uh, underutilized at the moment. And these two numbers, 20 and 100 kilometers, have, have been chosen for a reason. Uh, it's essentially the area which is between the utilized airspace and below what is commonly known as outer space. Uh, 20 kilometers is beyond where the civil commercial aircraft operate and 100 kilometers is way below the altitude where uh, satellites uh, can uh, operate, can maintain their orbit without being dragged by uh, the atmospheric force. And uh, economic activities in the sense that what we look at in our uh, study is uh, mostly how to uh, attract 
activities and business in this area uh, while not paying at this moment particular attention on, on other consideration from a security or defense related perspective, which are of course of high importance, but they are more for other area research. Um, so why did we uh, decide to work on this, uh, on this project? Um, at the moment, uh, several of the observers see the near space as a very potentially profitable uh, area uh, in terms of uh, activities, in terms of services to be provided. And there is a lot of interest from the private sector as well in investing in this area. Uh, however, so far, there has been not much uh, happening. And there are several reasons for that. Um, technological challenges, or security related consideration, if you imagine, uh, floating platform that are stationary above state territory, of course, that are security concern, privacy concern, and so on and so forth. However, there is also a legal aspect to it. Uh, under international law, being uh, air law or space law, there is no um, uh, clarity on the status of the near space. There is no treaty that deals with it. So essentially, what can and cannot be done uh, in that area under international law remain not clear. So uh, the idea of what we are proposing is essentially to attempt uh, to bring some clarity to this issue or at least to uh, allow the international community to start a discussion upon reaching this goal. And so in our mind, more clarity is in the sense of creating a level playing field where rules of operation are clear for all the actors involved. And by doing so, uh, we hope that more activities and more business will uh, proliferate in this area. So um, uh, in a nutshell, uh, what the US proposal is about, essentially the near space above the state territory in our, in our view should be considered this uh, uh, US in a way that we will explain in a second. And uh, once this is done, access and use of this area should be regulated by a predetermined set of rules, but also state of course, individual states will have the, the same of course, uh, but these rules will have a clear indication of, of rights and rules of all the actors involved. Of course, under this proposal, the right of the state above which a US is established shall maintain uh, a predominant right and sovereign right. Uh, obviously, if you hear this uh, little uh, suggestion with small suggestion, you may think of other precedent in international law, uh, for example, the exclusive utilization zone, which indeed has provided inspiration for our proposal. But also we have looked at other uh, theory of international law for example, uh, what the New Heaven School of Yale suggests, and we have used, utilized their uh, uh, theories uh, in order to maximize the use of resources to achieve uh, a common goal, essentially. Um, now, to go a little bit more, very briefly, a few bullet points on what we intend with the, with the US and how we um, suggest to establish it. Essentially, uh, the promoter of this uh, um, theory would be the state, uh, what we call the underneath state, uh, the state which, uh, above which the near space is located, it should be that state that should declare essentially uh, this, uh, the near space above the territory as the uh, US. Why a state would do so? It, that would be essentially a message to the international community that the state is willing to open up that area above its territory for use and use both from domestic and also international customers. Um, of course, the state that makes this choice will have a um, priority right of utilization, similar to what happens with the exclusive utilization zone and in the, in the, in the law of the sea. And uh, that state will have um, the right to establish the conditions of how the area should be utilized. And um, of course, establishing the US should not have um, implication on uh, the sovereign authority that the state has over its national airspace, which of course, as we all know, is part of the state territory. And uh, any use of the, of, the, of the near space should indeed be consistent with the preservation of national security and, and national safety interest. However, what we imagine is that by means of this proposal that a state would create the condition to open up the area for utilization. Uh, the last thing that we look at in our proposal is what are the conditions to operate for uh, foreign uh, operators. 
So indeed, uh, the condition for Fourier operator to operate will be discussed with the, with the underneath state, the state that declared the EUS, and that state would have indeed the right to uh, deny the foreign operator to, to operate and provide services in case of uh, um, undermining national security. Um, one of the final elements that we also suggest is that uh, prior authorization, a foreign operator should have the right to overflow through the through a foreign uh, US. So essentially, this is just a starting uh, point of our research. But um, if you're interested, of course, in this uh, in this suggestion, uh, which is gaining track also an international level, uh, we are very happy to answer all your questions, also to share some of the papers that we have written. Uh, the last on this topic, of course, the last thing that I want to add is that there are already countries that domestically are starting to regulate uh, about the activities in the near space. For example, uh, New Zealand and Australia have done so. So it is an area of growing interest. And uh, we believe that this the interest uh, from a technological and legal uh, perspective will continue to grow in the years to come. And uh, this basically concludes my presentation. I try to be as brief as possible uh, in the interest of time. And thank you very much again for the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Tonchetti, for a wonderful and interesting presentation. And uh, it's a very interesting concept, called concept of the uh, uh, near space and uh, how future to utilize it. Of course, there is a will be issue of sovereignty, uh, e sovereignty issues and the uh, free space issues because it's just on the uh, on the boundary of that uh, uh, applications. And uh, uh, that's what you start. Your research is very, very uh, interesting. And I think it, uh, it, it will come future to the merging with the un unmanned applications. And uh, of course, we, we should uh, continue in that. And then uh, I hope that uh, our future cooperation in these areas will uh, uh, assist uh, all the society to go on on that. Please send our best regards to Dr. Ali Hao and uh, to all your team and we wish all, all the best to you. Now I'm delighted to provide the floor to uh, representative of National Space Agency of uh, uh, Ukraine. So you see we go higher and higher <laughs> now. Now it's a space agency and uh, uh, the floor is given to Mr. Sergei Yanchevsky, who is the head of the Center of uh, Control for the Space Object. Please, Mr. Yanchevsky, floor is yours. Um, hello, dear friends. Uh, I have a short presentation about activity of uh, our National Space Center and maybe something what we, uh, we do uh, will be uh, useful for your activity, especially in uh, uh, aviation uh, sphere. Just a moment. I... Uh... I'll try to send my. Uh, can you help me with uh, no. my presentation, Olga? Uh, yes, yes, just a second. Okay. Because I uh, use my cell phone, so uh, well. Uh, so my presentation, areas of activity, National Space Center and possibilities in area of remote sensing of the Earth. Next, please. Uh, some words about uh, our team, about National Space Center. Uh, first of all, we are only one entity in, uh, in Ukraine and uh, not only uh, in Ukraine, but in Eastern Europe too, which can provide all kind of activity uh, for exploitation uh, sp uh, spacecraft and provide uh, all kind of uh, services. Um, our, uh, 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 we have uh, about uh, uh, 11 uh, um, uh, branches around uh, of Ukraine have a very so a solid uh, science background and uh, uh, there are uh, s uh, seven main uh, direction of our activity from uh, receiving information, pre-processing, processing information from satellite, uh, provide uh, uh, many kinds of uh, uh, thematic maps uh, for, uh, for, uh, uh, for all our uh, government uh, 
users. Uh, and uh, next one, uh, it's a uh, 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 space control. I mean, uh, space situation awareness and geophysical control uh, and uh, uh, GNSS or uh, space navigation. If you need the next uh, uh, slide, please tell us. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay, uh, it's an uh, uh, area of uh, activity of our ground station uh, in this uh, uh, big circle, uh, circle from, um, from France to Ural Mountains, from Scandinavia to Middle East. Uh, we can uh, uh, we can uh, be able to receive information from uh, from spacecrafts uh, in uh, real time in in real time regime uh, in real time mode. So uh, we can uh, we can get uh, space images uh, uh, in thirty minutes uh, from uh, moment of shooting. Uh, it's uh, it's a very nice possibility for for cooperation. Next one, please. Mm. We just, uh, now we are uh, we are ready for receiving information from uh, future uh, national uh, Ukrainian satellites, uh, and uh, uh, now we uh, we receive information from five. Uh, uh, s s satellites, uh, satellites with highest resolution up to the uh, 50 uh, centimeters per uh, one pixel. And uh, many information we receive from, uh, 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 from uh, satellites with open board. Uh, it's uh, satellites with middle resolution, uh, me meteor information and uh, uh, at least uh, uh, since uh, beginning of this uh, year, uh, on base of uh, National Space Center, uh, was created uh, uh, especially uh, Info Hub uh, System Copernicus. Uh, so uh, we receive information from six uh, European uh, satellites. Next, please. Uh, on this slide, you can see a process of uh, preparing and uh, uh, launching this in, uh, InfoHub Copernicus. It uh, it uh, it took about three three years, uh, but uh, we uh, signed uh, especially documents, especially agreement with uh, Euro Commission, with uh, Euro uh, Space Agencies, and now we are one from six uh, info hub uh, uh, in Europe. Next, please. Uh, and uh, uh, so some words about our services. Uh, we work according uh, system Copernicus and uh, uh, there are the main uh, six services, land monitoring, marine monitoring, atmosphere monitoring, emergency management, uh, security and uh, uh, also we uh, study climate change uh, with using of uh, satellite information and uh, as a result uh, uh, output of this activity is a value added services which uh, can be uh, simplicity and uh, useful uh, for every our users uh, most of uh, most of them is uh, ministries, uh, agencies, or other governmental uh, bodies. Next, please. Uh, next, please. Uh, okay, uh, some examples of our uh, uh, products. Uh, in area of land monitoring, uh, you can see uh, 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 auto-photo plan for uh, which uh, can which uh, which uh, 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 which were done by our specialist uh, for uh, in framework of uh, 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 reconstruction of uh, uh, airport Zhitomir uh, uh, with uh, many 
with information about owners of parcels, with information about uh, around situation. Uh, next, please. On this slide, you can see a uh, result of space monitoring of uh, reconstruction uh, airport uh, of uh, Odessa. And uh, especially for uh, our colleagues from uh, Dnipro, uh, we provide, uh, we provide uh, uh, space images uh, for, for study uh, all obstacles in a radius of uh, 50 kilometers around uh, airport Dnipro. So space images is very useful for uh, aviation sphere too. Next, please. Uh, next kind of monitoring, every two weeks we can uh, understand situation uh, around uh, our state from uh, level of state uh, up to level of fields. Uh, and uh, for uh, if we're talking about this slide, uh, we can see a, a situation with crops, with uh, humidity uh, and uh, other uh, things uh, for, for every uh, fields in Ukraine. Next, please. Uh, about marine monitoring, uh, there are many methods uh, we, uh, which uh, we use, uh, especially for monitoring of oil spills, um, uh, uh, ice situation, and uh, monitoring of shipping, and so on. In many ecology uh, moments. Next, please. Uh, 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 this example shows our activity in sphere of uh, uh, in sphere of uh, artificial intelligence and uh, deep learning, because uh, here we uh, we jo uh, we join information uh, from uh, space images uh, during two years. So uh, you can see uh, the main uh, uh, sh uh, shipping direction and. Uh, uh, common information about uh, size of these ships. Next, please. Uh, next uh, example uh, from direction of emergency management. Uh, it's a, a, a thematic map which shows a situation uh, around uh, a Crimean Titan plant. Uh, there were a big ecology accident. Uh, there were many uh, many fakes from Russia, but uh, uh, with the using of uh, space images, we can understand uh, really situation and uh, uh, can uh, found that uh, um, vegetation around uh, this plant were killed during four uh, four days about. Uh, uh, 50 56 uh, percent and during 10 days uh, all vegetation uh, around uh, this uh, plant uh, and near uh, city Armyansk was killed. Next please. Uh, next case which uh, I, I suppose that it's, it, it can be very useful for uh, aviation infrastructure for monitoring this infrastructure no, uh, rather interferometry methods. Uh, this method lets us to uh, um, to monitor and with sharpness of four or five millimeters uh, vertical displacement of uh, any uh, surfaces or objects. Uh, in in the in this slide, you can see uh, our uh, study uh, uh, the uh, uh, damages uh, uh, old uh, old buildings and uh, we can see uh, day by day what uh, what oh. one part of this uh, buildings uh, just uh, move down mm -hmm. next please nice. sergey yanchenko can we move forward please
uh, and and uh, last 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 my uh, slide. Uh, also, we uh, use uh, whole uh, space information for monitoring atmosphere, for monitoring climate change, and uh, we have our geo portal, uh, which can be used by you for uh, for for studies at Ukraine around all, all Ukraine uh, for uh, for aviation activity too. Thank you for info, uh, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Anchavsky, for your uh, presentation. We have a great experience with the National Space Agency, especially myself, more than 30 years. And uh, I remember and then we started to prepare the Galileo Agreement for the European Union, and I drafted a big part of this agreement together with the uh, National Space Agency, and they also represented uh, Ukraine once in the and of course, part of drafting resolution for the peaceful use of outer space, I mean, the United Nations resolution, but it was years ago. Now I'm very happy to see the progress which you do, especially technically. And I hope that one day we'll also finish the project with the RIMS installation in, the, in Ukraine and there will be part of the uh, common monitoring system of, with, the, with the Europe. And thank you again for your uh, very interesting and detailed pre presentation. And now I will move to our uh, 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 last but not least and very important speaker from India. Uh, good, now I should say good evening, Professor uh, Nishahat Oisha. And uh, I would like to provide the uh, floor to you. And uh, now I'm happy to give the uh, um, uh, floor to Dr. Nishahat Oisha. O Oya. I think the uh, uh, advisor cybersecurity of Minister of uh, Communications and, uh, and IT of Government of India. Uh, please, Dr. Uh, Oja is, o Oja is uh, your floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm very much audible to everybody. And uh, very good evening to all of you. It's the last uh, speech and last presentation. So I'll quickly wind it up so that you do not get exhausted. And I speak uh, on point to point. Uh, I would like to thank Rector, the Vice Rector, and my colleague Igor, who gave me an, an opportunity to speak on the Ninth World Congress Aviation in the 21st century on behalf of the Government of India. So I would just like to throw some lights on the uh, cyber security issues. So we'll just like to say something about with rising cyber threats to critical defense and civil infrastructure. Now, combating these threats is becoming a priority for the country. This is a driving growth in the demand for the cybersecurity solutions in the aerospace and the defense ministry. Against this backdrop, cybersecurity remains the top topic of the discussion for the aerospace and defense sectors in, in India in 2019. Drones and UAV are the cyber physical meaning and integration of the competition, as we all know, everybody. The main technology components of drones are physical structure airframes, the proposal system and the embedded computing system, the ECS, such as a ground control system, GCS, autopilot systems. So these are the two points in which we are basically focusing on in an Indian scenario. The drones have been identified as a vulnerable to cyber attacks since the scope and the uh, uh, geographic regions of the drones are expanding. So the more and more it is be becoming a vulnerable to the cyber attacks. So that is also one of the more core area for the on behalf, I mean, in context to the India. And uh, the drones has been identified as a vulnerable to cyber attacks because of the uniqueness of the network and dispersed physical systems located in the remote uh, places. And because of the cyber attacks, which can result in the defective operation of the control loop and the denial of the services. So I uh, will just quickly speak it up. And uh, the aerospace and the defense industry in India has been undergoing a lot of transformation as warfare is no longer conducted only on land, air or sea, as we know about in the, we are seeing in the global context, but also in the cyberspace, which is emerging as a battle ground for the modern warfare. Cyber threats have become a multifold with the crit critical military and civil infrastructure, increasingly getting connected over the internet and at the same time, making them vulnerable to the cyber attacks. So we would like to say that cybersecurity is not a matter of the national security and the safety of our infrastructure and our war fighters. The bottom line is that the cyber threat is real and it is very much here. Now, in context to in, in India, 
and when we came in contact to the uh, national uh, aviation university we just want to inform you that we are in process of getting in an mou signed with the national aviation university we already have a drones corridor which is likely to get established in india where we will be inviting lot of drones uh, manufacturers lot of the center for excellence from the different parts of the country who can come here they can show cars and we can enter into in a kind of a center for excellence with them and also we are entering into certain kinds of uh, center for excellence for the academia where we can do we can cooperate we can coordinate with them in lot of scientific projects which can enhance which can help our country and their country in enhancing the national security and other factors of the logistics and other commercial activities so this uh, i mean i would like to uh bring on the record also that we are in the process and very soon by the end of another 2 to 3 weeks we'll be able to sign an mou with the national aviation university and this is a, i mean this was the wonderful platform which i have seen from my naked eye ninth world congress aviation in the 21st century i would also like to welcome and i would also like to invite each and everybody who is basically interested in coming with certain kind of a technologies and who want to share some kind of a technology with government of india and since we i have already told that we are coming with the kind of a drones and uav corridor means there will be lot of industries which will be working on the pp model private public partnership model so a government can come into with the government directly and also with the private so this is all from my side i will not take much because you all know about the cyber security and you all know about the ai you all know about the ml so i will not talk much more about that but just i would like to thank you and it was a wonderful session especially uh, i mean a lot of insight came and a lot of the you can say we have found out a lot of areas where we can expand and uh, i mean government of india is opening its arms to everybody who can who wants to come and we can work together within this particular industry thank you rector thank you vice rector and my friend egor who is continuously interacting with me and sooner or later we will be do something with the ukraine by signing an mou with you thank you so much thank you thank you professor for your wonderful speech and the, whatever we uh, uh, discussed today all areas whether it's drone artificial intelligence air traffic management everything is now about cybersecurity and uh, you're right it's everywhere and it's very broad uh, subject and uh, we are very happy that you highlighted that and now uh, i would like again to thank you and thank you for your staying late because i know this evening in india and uh, so good evening i hope you have a good dinner with your family and you, today and you can manage it and uh, thank you again we really appreciate your patience and now uh, i i feel a bit uh, uh, sorry for we inter interrupted uh, luish campus and uh, dr campus now i would like to give you a floor to say at least final words uh, to our audience and uh, uh, we will be happy to hear you and uh, you with your closing remarks thank you so um, i'll just show a, a bit my final slide on on covid-19 um so just as a brief conclusion the recovery will be slowest for long haul travel due to on coordinated deconfinement so probably not before 2022 2023 short haul travel is strongly dependent on coordinated deconfinement and recovery can take months or years uh, following mostly the lost 2020 holiday season Uh, we will have to face survival until the holiday season 2021 business travel is more depressed than holiday travel there is a lot of discussion whether we have total recovery or 70 to 100% recovery is very dependent on the evolution of covid-19 if we have a vaccine we can have a second wave we have rising infection numbers well i thank you for your attention um Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Luis, for your very good presentation. This is a tremendous analytics which you did actually, and uh, of course, there is uh, uh, there is a subject for the whole session, not only the one uh, presentation, the plenary session. And I hope that we can 
you, you will agree that we need to uh, to discuss it in more details and uh, of course we will be happy to contact you again good afternoon it's a, my my great great pleasure today to address at this conference. I am Aapo Sederberg, the CEO of Cyberat Finland. My warm regards from Finland to Ukraine. I am today going to speak about cyber challenges in, in aviation. Aviation is really one of the critical functions of the societies. Aviation has been really uh, critical during the, the corona crisis, so we have seen in a way, one part of the vulnerabilities in aviation ecosystem. What about cyber? What is, what is cyber and how it's linked to the avi aviation? The cyber challenge is growing all the time. We are witnessing many actors in, in, in the field of cyber security. The criminals are lo looking money, the nation states, some of them are, are looking political impacts. We don't know what the cyber terrorists are looking for. Hackers are, are, are look, looking how to, to come in and make success stories in the aviation ecosystem. So the cyber threat is real. We can't put it on the side. We can't deny it. So we have to find the right approach how to solve the cyber challenges in the future. And we should not just be looking at the current situation. We have to be looking ahead. What is coming ahead? What is the future of the aviation? What is the future of cyber security or cyber attacks and cyber challenges and how to solve this problem? Aviation ecosystem, it's really a complex one. If you are looking at an air airport, it's like a mini society. There are a number of key stakeholders who are, who are actors in, in, in the field. In our minds, we are perhaps just thinking that, that aviation is the aircraft and air traffic control. Of course, they are there and they are very critical. But then all the ground services, all the passengers, they are part of the challenge. So we have to be able somehow to regulate and control the whole aviation e ecosystem, starting for, for, from the very small things coming to the really, really, really big things like, like aircraft and, 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 and air traffic control. And perhaps in the challenge picture, we have to add one small element, and it's up how we want to define it. Are drones part Good of the aviation ecosystem? Many experts are saying that drones, they have to, to, to follow the same, same aviation rules which, which our, our traditional aviation is, is, is following. So drones will actually increase the complexity of the aviation ecosystem. They are operated everywhere. They are part of the, of the critical infrastructures of modern society. They have been. They they will be used in in many 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 purposes in modern societies. Smart cities, smart mobility, uh, logistical chains. They will be dependent on drones. So that's something we have to bear in mind. That that, that the complexity of the aviation ecosystem is is growing. Where are the vulnerabilities? Why I'm speaking about vulnerabilities? The vulnerabilities, actually, they are the easy targets. They are the targets which uh, everyone who wants to do cyber, cyber attacks are, are looking for. And if we go around the aviation ecosystem, at the airport, looking all the devices, all digital devices around the, every airport, at the civilian side and also at the military side of the aviation, they are numerous. And they all are having vulnerabilities. Then, after the takeoff, of, we are facing fa facing the, uh, the flight safety, air control, the aircraft, the command and control control system, navigation system. They are all 
again digital. All of these elements include vulnerabilities. So the challenge is who knows the vulnerabilities? And cyber spionage is actually the tool through which the, the bad guys and those who want to do cyber attacks in avi aviation, they, 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 they are lo lo looking, looking for. So we have to admit that there will be always vulnerabilities. We have created a new term, secure by design. It, would be, it is said that it it's could, could be the solution for the cyber security. Okay, the air control had to be secure by defined. Who is responsible? Is it the national authorities? It, is it the international the, the regulators or, or who? Is it the airport? There are a lot, a lot of actors, actors, so we come to the, the cooperation. Then looking to aircraft. If you are looking, we are looking at the, the airplanes which um, are actually flying today. Many of them are old. There are old technologies. There are old vulnerabilities in in in, in the system. So we could continue the lo logistic at the airport, the the, the uh, con control sy systems at the, at the airport, security system, and so on. The, the, this is a never-ending story. So we have to make clear the responsibilities and then become who is responsible. Who is responsible avia on, on aviation safety? Of course, we have the international organizations. In Europe, we have our own, own aviation security organizations. And at, at the national level, we have the national security, which should, should be inclu including... Uh, which should include also the aviation. Then there had to be clear where, 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 who is responsible. And actually, I would appeal to the national level. At national level, there had to be the leadership. There had to be the co co coordination because the operators, the, the, the air carriers and everything, it can be regulated. That, or the easy way to regulate this is, is at, at, at the national level. Okay, now I have been speaking about the vulnerabilities in the digital devices, in the technical, logical size. But of course, then, then we have the human factor. And then we have the processes, how we, we, we behave, how, how the modern aviation ecosystem is, is working. So all of them are carry, carrying, carry, carry, having, they are all having vulnerabilities. So we have to be able to take a comprehensive manner to, to, to cyber security. And what does it mean? Actually, comprehensive approach means that we have to be able to improve cyber security in all those domains. People have to be well trained. There have to be rules how people, people uh, can be, behave at the airport, at the aircraft, and, and, and through the whole Whole, whole, say, uh, the whole flight. And then how to improve the national procedures, how the life safety should be improved every, every day. If the cyber challenge is growing all the time, then the life safety system had to be improving uh, all, all the time its, um, its performance. So really comprehensive approach is, 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 is a must on this field. So I spoke about the, the secure by design. And uh, I think the, the, the manufacturers who, who are building new aircraft, they, they are in air carriers, they, they, they are looking secure by design principle. But then we have the legacy systems and, and that, that, that's, that's an other story. Should they be updated? Because cyber security is normally looking the easy targets, and they are not in the modern aircraft. They are perhaps more, 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 more in the old one. So this, this is this is this is the thing which which we have to be focusing on. Then the zero trust principle. What is zero trust? Actually, in aviation, that should be one of the key principles. Because 
you ha- have the responsibility. I said that I recommend to take the, the security responsibility at the national level. Then you have to know the whole ecosystem. You have to know the devices. You have to know the level of the educa- case, case of the key, uh, education of the key, key stakeholders. Then you can follow the zero trust. You have to know who, who to trust and who are the, the, the trusted service providers. So this is a very complex um, interplay. And how to make the change? We speak about cyber culture. So I would appeal, we have to create a new cyber culture for the aviation. Because aviation is critical for our society. It's critical for all of us. We all are flying. We all feel, feel that, that we want to, to have a secure flight. But that at the same, same, same time, it's, it's, so aviation is, is critical also in that sense, that if you make a cyber attacks and, and you, you make 9-11 impact with cyber tools, then the consequences are huge. So it's a wanted target because you can use aircraft as, as weapon and it's old fashioned to, to just to use the conventional means, but now the cyber means they, they, are, they make it possible to, to violate the aviation system. So that's why aviation cybersecurity should be one uh, focus area for the national cybersecurity. In every country, this has to be taken seriously. And at the same time, we, we have to be able to build an international co- co- cooperation on global level, on European level, and, and then, then follow the rules. So we have to look, look uh, what should be done. I think the first thing is awareness. The decision makers, they have to have the right awareness. We ha- ha- have, to, have to admit, admit, admit the challenges. And then we have to create better risk assessment, cyber risk assessment for, for aviation ecosystem. And then based on that, we can take the right actions. And then international cooperation is the key to success. We have to be able to share the information. We have to be a- 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 able to, to share the best practices. And, and we have to be able to work, to work together and, 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 and to really find, fight against the style actors who, who want, want to use, misuse avi- aviation for their own purposes. I hope I could enlighten some of the thoughts which I, I have been ha- having on, on, on the, this, this issue. And I'm happy to, to answer your questions. Please send me an email and I come back to you. Thank you very much. Chenda 在弗拉基米尔伊塞安科校长和亚历山大伊万诺夫院长的带领下祝乌克兰无人机行业高速发展谢谢大家尊敬的主持人各位来宾女士们先生们今天非常荣幸参加乌克兰第九届航空发展与
和浙江金蛋科技有限公司一起在乌克兰基辅签约成立，由此开展了全面的合作，面向本地区的产业升级、专业领域包括新材料、航空类的高端仪器制制造、摩擦润滑，在工业智能装备领域开展了全面的合作，通过技术转移转化，为浙江的企业。提供服务得到了当地政府和企业的认可支持。乌克兰国立航空大学历史悠久，在世界民航大学中名列前茅，是培养乌克兰专家、工程师的摇篮。在航空航天领域，拥有世界众多前沿的技术。可以说，研究院的成立和合作，为我们中乌两国在科技经济领域的合作打开了一个窗口。我们非常感谢乌克兰国立航空大学对我们的信任和支持。中国在航空航天领域发展的时间不长，迈向航空大国的过程中还有很多的路要走，尤尤其是在航空材料、航空技术以及航空人才的培养，有巨大的发展前景。我们到目前为止与国内一流的顶尖高校开展了全面的合作。向上海航空航天研究院、北京航空材料研究所、北京航空航天大学等等开展了全面的一些项目合作、经济共享，然后也是得到了国内一线专家的认可和支持。我们取得的成就离不开乌克兰国立航空大学对我们的支持。路遥知马力，日久见人心。随着合作的深入。我们今年申请成功了“一带一路”国际合作组织，同时也召开了世界青年科学家论坛。我们希望通过跟乌克兰国立航空大学的合作，充分发挥中国市场的优势，为中国、乌克兰乃至全球航空航天领域的产业创新和提升做出更大的努力。最后，祝第九届航空发展大会取得圆满成功。Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Robin Bishun, and I'm very honored to address you here at the Ninth World Congress: Aviation in the 21st Century. Hereby, I also extend my special thanks to Mr. Isayenko, Director of the National Aviation University of the Ukraine. Thank you for bringing us all together, and my esteemed audience. Hereby, I would like to start my presentation. Industrial evolution has always had a great impact on societies. Now, with the new technology coming in, UAVs, in other words, drones, we are going to get to the next level in terms of the influence on economics, logistics, and even industries like agriculture, architecture, oil and gas. But before we get into detail, let's have a look at the content of this presentation. We start with discussing the current world situation and how that relates to an end of an era of certain world powers actually losing their main strength. From all there, we go into social impact because new technologies does change the way how workforce can be utilized and how that influences the social behavior of major、uh, parts of the society. Well. Then we come to our actual topics: UAVs. UAVs are indeed the pink elephant in the room. Many decision makers and regulators they need to start to come to an understanding how these new technological items are influencing society. From there, we come to a finalization of this presentation and talk about some of the current affairs that are of importance. Like the regulatory setting of UAVs. On this slide, we use several pictures to show you what is currently going on on a global scale. We've got COVID-19. We've got increased weapon sales in different countries. We have non-civil use of UAVs intensively over the last years. Then we see our main industry of oil and gas under tremendous pressure. Where does this all lead us to? Now, hopefully, to a greener world, with a beautiful sunshine for our next generations. 
So let's round this all up. Let's see where we are in 2020. With COVID-19, countries are still under partial lockdown. We see the trade wars taking a lot of economic value from different countries. Supply chains are being blocked. The oil and gas industry is under pressure, not only because of the price fall of these commodities due to COVID and the logistics issues, but also because of green energy is taking a major part in what is going to come next in the coming five to 10 years. Oil and gas companies already have been shifting their investments into solar, wind, and other forms of new energy. Now what comes next is also fundamental to the economic equation, weapon sales. And weapon sales tell us that something is boiling in the society. In terms of civil weapon sales in the US, they are skyrocketing. Next to that, national militaries are boosting their armaments and weaponry on an incredible scale. So we see that countries are pushing for security. The end of an era, that is what is next. We see the function of de-dollarization. We see that new technological evolutions are groundbreaking and they break the barriers of any boundaries between countries. People are reaching out to each other. And I think that this event where we all utilize internet-based technologies to communicate with each other is an example of humanity as its best. But let's get back to the point. We had industrial revolutions. We know the industry has been pushing forward technologies for utilizing IoT, AI and robotics. But before we go to the next level, I would like to say some very, very important point. This is about Professor Dr. Schumpeter. What he always put forward was creative destructiveness. This concept, this concept that is very important for supporting entrepreneurship, brings us actually with the understanding that value comes by letting it evolve. Examples are the invention of the wheels, steam engines, nuclear fission. We need to create better efficiencies. That's where we always look for. Drivetrain technology. The question is if you want to enhance the value for society or you want to look at corporate margins. And there is a very interesting example for that. When you had the toothpaste tubes, they used to be very tight and small in order to preserve toothpaste because it was very expensive but nowadays if you look at the tubes actually the openings are much wider than before now ladies and gentlemen I think that you can understand why these openings are much wider and of course it's all about corporate margins but things are changing people are aware becoming much more aware about what is going to happen and what is happening right now how does that come to be? Well, internet-based social media, the communications and data flows are more or less open. We see the new rulers, which are the social media that are coming together with Apple, Microsoft, Google and others. The old powers, oil and gas and affiliates, actually are also investing in these internet-based players. So we see that uh, they are switching their core business as already stated before. This brings us to social impact. Social impact and the idea of how we want to structure our society. Because in the end it's about people, it's about individuals, persons that, that live together and make this society slash economy something worthwhile to be in. So here we have to recognize that one of the concepts of social behavior, which is called inclusiveness, must never be forgotten. So we must see the value of others. United we stand. Yes, indeed. When the COVID situation happened, we saw a lot of different ideas and thoughts. We do hopefully can salute the people of Wuhan to be an example of standing together. And that is something that we should keep in mind. United we stand. 
social impact is often uh, related to the creation of synergies between people or having colonial thoughts where a person that creates value is taken advantage on because of lack of power or lack of understanding of what another interest group wants to take from that person. Now we need to form opinions on basis of references and make sure that it is connected to the fundamental definitions of economics, police and security so to say because that relates back to UAVs. In regards to the information made available on the internet there is also certain standard procedures that we should keep certain regulations or rules of respect and appreciation towards each other in mind due to cultural differences there can be misunderstandings but it's very fundamental to always have an open mind and be transparent in the actual intent that people have towards each other Now we come to the pink elephant in the room. Uh, I guess everybody was waiting for this one. UAVs, ladies and gentlemen. Let's get this boat rocking. While looking at drones, we need to understand why drones are currently widely available all across the globe. Whenever you take a plane and you're in an airport, you see drones being available. And most of them are drones made in China. But are these actually Chinese drones or is there more that meets the eye? Well here we have to look at the supply chains of drones. The different uh, components have patents and licenses that are from many different countries and the main country that provides that is the USA actually. So when we look at drones it's not just a drone from a certain country. No it's a drone that is uh, an assembled unit made from different components from all over the globe. Now China provides economies of scale and that reduces the cost tremendously so end users, consumers from all over the globe they can nicely utilize and purchase these type of goods. Drones nowadays they have got a variety of payloads as you can see cameras, listening devices but also they have got very good uh, connections to different industries such as agriculture, architecture, uh, survey and rescue. So we should make sure that we understand first of all drones can reach everywhere and second of all they are in every industry providing a large benefit for all. In consideration of uh, education and skill set of workers we see that drones are able to do logistics in a very optimal way including it with AI and other robotics tools, they are able to be much more efficient than a normal uh, employee in that type of work. So we see that um, companies like SF Express, DHL, uh, TNT, they are utilizing and testing this type of machinery. But they are not the only one in logistics, also McDonald's, KFC, and other service providers in the food industry do the same. Edom in agriculture. So we understand the true impact. So the question is, is there a positive side effect for, for society as such? Well, yes, we have got different research available from, for example, the US by Jenkins and Fasein that jobs are being created due to needs for programming, redesign and maintenance for these type of tools. So it seems that there is a definite benefit for new work to be provided but the workforce needs to be re-educated. And here we come back to the example of automation when automation came into the ports, into the harbors and dock workers were no longer necessary we have the same type of situation. We need to make sure that the workforce is ready to be re-educated and goes to the next level. A nice connection is, is actually the education for children nowadays because that includes often programming, building of robots and even UAVs are being included. So our society is getting ready 
to go to that next level. Dear audience, now finally we come to the conclusion. In this conclusion, I would like to address three important parts. One is economic viability of uh, new technologies. And you saw, for example, what is happening with um, uh, battery-based cars, the EVs. They have a market and they are growing actually by strict regulations and subsidies by different countries, although those subsidies are fading away. But these EVs uh, had a jump start. Now with UAVs, most of it uh, you can see that they didn't have that type of support and they were basically from the start quite economically viable. That is uh, an interesting uh, phenomena which requires more research. Now looking at the usage of drones, uh, here comes uh, the interesting part because when using drones you do have to respect other people not to be involved with uh, a drone that is flying over too close or too near. You should never bring anybody in harm's way. Privacy needs to be respected and next to that you need to make sure that when you fly don't go into the red zones, you know, airfields or others. So when having a drone it's not just about you know like driving a car, it's a kind of a very constrained area. But if you have a drone it's an area that, that reaches out in society itself. So drones also bring social consciousness to the pilots and to the users and they can be utilized very beautifully as we can see in the many pictures that people take or in the different air industries where they bring great value. Did you know that the first drones that were tested in Australia by the Beachwatch were actually utilized for saving people at their first test flights? That's phenomenal. And that is why we have technologies to do good for humanity. Now we come to the, the third one, the regulatory setting. Well, we're preparing a special compilation, and it will be published later this year, for regulatory settings in different countries. People need to be aware when they are traveling or when they are in a certain country, how to utilize drones and understand uh, when to use them, why to use them, in a commercial setting or in a personal setting that should be all well put down on paper and provided to uh, every global citizen. The conclusion, UAVs, doom or gloom, what will await us? It depends on how we use them. It depends on how we are seeing society in the future. What I do agree is that we need to be prepared and prevent, that means that the global awareness about utilizing technologies not only for UAVs but for all types of technologies including what we are utilizing in the social phenomena we need to make sure that the key word is inclusiveness so I hope next year to be addressing you again to be continued ladies and gentlemen it's my great pleasure to speak to you and again, I would like to address my thanks to now the team for bringing this conference together under very difficult times that we have to face jointly. One more thanks to the rector, Mr. Isayenko. Thank you very much. And I wish you all great health and a very beautiful day and a good Congress. Thank you. Dear colleagues, academics, online guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to be talking today here on the World, on the World Aviation Congress at the National Aviation University of uh, Kiev and Ukraine, even though it's going to be virtually. Anyway, my name is Yanni, and uh, I'm going to talk today more about uh, UAV CAN systems and how the UAV CAN systems are going to modernize a, a uh, unmanned vehicles. So let's get started. Okay, uh, today's uh, content is uh, first introductions, and then I will go quickly through uh, UAV CANs in uh, CAN systems in generic and then uh, benefits of the CAN systems in overall, and then I have a small uh, UAV CAN demo for, for you all to show. 
So my name is uh, Jani Hirvinen and I'm originally uh, born in Finland but uh, currently I'm based in here in uh, Bangkok, Thailand and uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Ardupilot, Drone Code and several other international uh, organizations that are creating all kind of uh, unmanned systems, uh, software, hardware and, and so on. I am also uh, vice chairman of the World UAV Federation and uh, a board member of the Sensen UAV Industry Association. My biggest one contribution for unmanned industries is the Ardukopter platform that basically started this whole drone revolution, what we are going currently. Okay, so CAN systems have been here uh, around us already several decades. Uh, they are everywhere basically, we just don't notice, uh, notice them because they are inside devices, they are inside microwave ovens, they are inside our vehicles, they are inside our medical devices and so on. So they are here, they have been here long long ago and they are really robust and good one systems. Originally CAN bus was created by Robert Bosch uh, on, on the early 1980s uh, and, and uh, it was created because of need for, for heavy industries like for trucks and others, uh, heavy transport industry like trucks and others and, and because uh, the, the vehicles they are really big one and the long distances and others so there was a need to have a robust communication system between like uh, the front and the back of uh, light systems and, and uh, different kind of sensors, control valves and all that kind of stuff. So that's why CAN system was originally created. Uh, it came on the mainstream around on early uh, 90s uh, when the CAN 2.0 was published and uh, nowadays if you have uh, let's say less than 20 years old uh, uh, vehicle at your home whatever kind of car you definitely have a CAN system on your vehicles already. Uh, then again, because we've been working on unmanned industries a lot, on, just like on my Ardupilot group and uh, PX4 groups and drone code and others, uh, several years ago we were starting to think about, okay, how can we make better our communication systems and especially when the UAVs uh, and other unmanned vehicles are getting much more bigger, so we need the longer one cables and others, so we were looking at, okay, what do we have that we can start using this one? And, and then CAN was kind of for uh, the easy way of going because uh, the hardware is uh, ready for that one. Components are easily available on the market. So that was easy way to go. Um, overall, when we're talking about uh, especially UAV CAN devices, it's not just limited UAVs, even though the name is pointing towards that one. We can use these devices on all kind of uh, unmanned vehicles. It doesn't matter if it's a rover, a ground-placed vehicle, or is it an aerial vehicle like for a fixed wing or multi-copter or, or even a submarine or sailboats or, or whatever. It can be placed on ev uh, all, all these kind of uh, places and all kind of devices. It doesn't even have to be a moving device. It can be whatever system so so it's really uh, flexible in that sense overall how can system is working we have a per, we have a device that is talking to the can bus and then we have a listening systems driving lights or whatever so the can system can send okay uh, id number 42 uh, here's message for you and, and then only the ID number 42 is going to pick up that message from the CAN bus. All the other devices, they just ignore the messages. So it's a really good way of communicating and, and we don't have blockages on that way. Traditionally, when we're talking about uh, UAVs, uh, fixed things and others, a little bit like, like what I have in here. So, so traditionally, we are taking all the cables are going on the autopilot in the front. And, and we have a long cables going around the uh, whole vehicle and in generally those long cables they are prone to get interferences. So, so 
that's that's a problem especially when you start building a, a bigger one UAVs some of my UAVs what I'm uh, working currently are seven eight meters wingspan so there's a massive uh, long cables and, and without the CAN systems basically it would be more or less impossible to build them and make them working a properly now because of CAN it's it's a data bus so you can have a, a, a uh, easy bus system going from the front of the vehicle to the end of the vehicle and uh, you can connect devices uh, along the way. Uh, so basically you only need to have a one uh, cables going uh, all the way in a vehicle and then you just connect on the bus. Uh, this will also, because the CAN system is been uh, designed to be really robust so there's no interferences unless you make something really bad and then the whole system is not working which is uh, another story but in can in generally can you can make horrible horrible interferences without disturbing uh, the can system uh, another really good one thing on can systems is that because we can have multiple buses running on the same vehicle so we can have a priority bus okay these are priority devices just like for control services maybe your motor engine control and others they are always on a priority then you can have a let's say like a camera control which is not that important so if you temporarily lose your camera control it doesn't matter it's just camera that you you are losing and, and, and uh, but your your vehicle can still operate uh, basically okay so, so uh, that's a good thing. Same thing uh, when we have multiple buses, we can uh, give a lot of redundancy on the system for those priority systems, especially just like for control services and engine management and others. So we can have double, triple, quadruple or whatever amount of, of uh, uh, buses running, running through the system. And if one of them fail, the system automatic falls back on, on the other ones. Now, Adding more, adding more is really simple. Normally, if you would like to add later on some like for lights on your wingtips, well, it would mean that you would have to bring all the cables through the wings and, and, and uh, maybe in worst case break the wings. Otherwise, you cannot get the cables in. But when you have a CAN buses, it's basically as simple as taking a devices, connecting them to cables, and off you go. So that's why CAN bus is really nice because it's uh, uh, easy expander, ex expandable, uh, really robust systems providing you a multiple buses and redundant systems. So overall, what kind of a devices we have on, on, on uh, CAN systems? There's a lot already. Um, I've been talking several years about these ones and now especially this year many of the companies around the world are starting to pr bring all kinds of CAN devices on the market. Basically I could say that there's a, a one or two new devices coming almost every month so the, the variety is going to grow a lot. Okay now let's look about the devices. So. Okay, I have some uh, CAN buses in here. For example, this is a one uh, compass system. Uh, then, for example, we have a, a servo control systems in here. A little bit similar what I have on, on the demo system in here. Uh, we can have, for example, gasoline uh, sensors and others. This is going to be you know, gasoline pipes and, and uh, the CAN uh, receivers on that one. And here we have our, our test system that what I was planning to show you now. So let me change to the computer screen and we can see about the, what we have in here. So one second like that one. There we have. And then let's bring this one. Okay, so uh, we have uh, the SL CAN and of course a computer in here which is not visible on the uh, video, but we have the SL CAN. This is just to connect on the, the CAN bus itself and uh, transfer it to be as a USB so I can connect my computer. It doesn't matter are we using computer or are we using uh, auto parts or whatever. All the things are same. This is just for, for now showing. So then we have a USB uh, CAN hub which is in here. 
where you can connect a lot of other devices. Uh, we have a small joystick in here that I can control all these servos. Uh, the joystick is connected on, on uh, the device number uh, 51. Uh, and then we have one device which uh, don't have any dedicated ID number, so it's totally uh, dynamic from the system. Then we have several devices that have a, a dedicated ID number, which is a ID number 70 and ID number 71. And of course, on the end of those ones, we have a servos. So let's start the UAV CAN uh, interface. Uh, there we go, and now we just connect a, a, uh, the cable, connect the UAV CAN cable to the SL CAN adapter, and there we go. Immediately we have four devices. Number 51, like I say, that's the, the uh, uh, joystick. And then we have the number uh, 65, which is uh, this one. Uh, this one guy in here, currently on uh, channel number, I think it's two. And then we have 70 and 71. So let's just have, yeah, uh, left, right, we have a, a channel number one and up, down on joystick, we have a channel number two. So uh, we can easily see now that these two servos, the 70 and 65 are listening uh, uh, channel number two. So I would like to modify and move uh, the 65 to be on this one channel. So let's just, so that's number two. This is number two. So I want it to be a channel number one. So if I put it right all the way, there we are. So now we have them put on the other way. So this is a really uh, simple uh, demonstration of how easily you can configure the UAV CAN systems. and. It is even possible to do it this one when you are operating a system. Of course, you have to be careful when you're doing a, a hot configurations, uh, when you're operating your machinery or whatever. So usually people don't, uh, are not doing it. But if you have, let's say, uh, for example, control surface failure on your vehicle, so and then you have multiple servos, uh, on, on the vehicle, so then you can take one of them out and uh, modify it, okay, you are also going to be working as, as, as a normal control surface. For example, like if you have a flaps and, and uh, you, you are temporarily losing, let's say, your right aileron, so you can uh, modify your right flap to be as an aileron, if, if that's the case. Uh, with traditional systems, you just cannot do that. Now, just like I say that the DU CAN system is really dynamic. So let's just connect quickly this airspeed sensor on the CAN bus and then uh, it should pop up immediately on the system. There we have an automatic, it was given uh, ID number 125. Okay, so thank you for listening. And uh, if there's any questions or things like that, uh, there's my WeChat uh, QR code and, and uh, also my contact information. So please be free to contact and, and uh, we can talk more about you and uh, uh, the unmanned uh, industry developer in general. Thank you. Bye bye. Hello, everyone. I'm Stephen Sutton from the Flyby Guys. And today I'm going to be talking about social acceptance for drones. So without further ado, let's cue the music. work is going on right now with drone deliveries and other drone services but nothing really seems to be happening mainly due to legislation but at the same time there's a lot of negativity going on with drones the press obviously don't help with this if there's a negative story it will be pushed out there if there's a positive story it might be out there but it certainly will not grab as much attention as the negative stories.
because negative stories create more attention. This is having a problem with the acceptance of drones. And the more that we have less acceptance of drones, we are not going to see anything happening with drone deliveries or other drone services happening for a very, very long time. I would like to see more attention to, to be put into social acceptance. And this is something that we should be doing together. We should be working together with the community, not just the drone community, but the actual communities out there to be more helping with uh, social acceptance. Make them, you know, showing the public that drones are doing good things and they're not bad things and they're not used for spying. There is this, uh, let's say, this idea out there that all the drones are doing bad things. And this is basically just down to understanding, like I said. We have to, you know, you know we have to educate. We have to, we have, we, we have to promote. Um, a good example of what I do, uh, I, when I'm working, when I'm out in the field, uh, you know, especially if I'm in public, I do tend to have people come up to me being a bit interested in what I'm doing. I will happily stop what I'm doing for five, ten minutes and talk with the people, show them what I'm doing. You know, because this is a this really helps if we can get through to one or two people. You know, hopefully we can get through to more eventually. Um, so this is something that we really need to be focusing on for for the future. Uh, I would like to see more happening within social acceptance. Only then can we have the ability to have drone deliveries to have other services that can be more accepted. Because right now there's just a fear of drones. Negative, negative, negative. That's all we seem to get. How can we push the positive? Well, like I said, we have to help. We have to push with the community. Uh, I would like to see lots of different ideas. I would like to see the drone community come together and discuss this more about what we can do. I would like to see the drone community talk with the, the press. You educate the press. At the same time, I do understand the press and their motives with having, uh, having, you know, having negative headlines. We just seen this week that there was a drone flying over a helicopter landing pad in America. We just seen a drone landing in a baseball field in America. All this negative headline is, is not going to do us any good. And, uh, and, and, you know, there are things happening which are good. There are rescues happening every day with drones, but we don't see them in the news. If you want to look for it, you can find it. It will be out there. But, you know, the press don't seem to focus on it and they won't focus on it because why should they? It won't, you know, it won't give them many hits on their website. So there are lots of studies out there for social acceptance. I would like to see those studies pushed out more into the community. I would like to see more, more data being, being used as to why drones are good put out in the public. Show them. Maybe we could have, you know, community events where we could have drones and we can show the public. Um, one thing I do, which is a, 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 you know, kind of a good thing for like some families, when I got business cards made, I had some stickers made that were given to me by the company who made the, uh, the um, business cards and and the stickers really just have the logo and the drone on it and you know when I'm out there and I get a family who stops and you know the kids want to come up and have a look and and the dad is always more interested as well of course but um, I usually give the kids stickers which of course the family is really happy and of course the kids are delighted but you know these are things that can help us seem more approachable you know it, I mean, it was purely accidental the way that the thing happened but 
um, it's always good that they walk away and they have a positive aspect about you know a drone company. Uh, the you know these are very very small things of course, but you know uh, the, these are things that you know we should be focusing on. How can we help you know promote what we are doing as a business as technology, uh, and then maybe we could see more let's say drone deliveries happening in more built up areas rather than. Uh, low-lying areas because uh, if we have them in low de you know if we have drone deliveries in low densely populated areas that means that we have low amount of data and if we have low amount of data then that's not good data to work on to see if something's going to be a success we need to have lots of data and to have lots of data you have to have those in built-up areas uh, but legislation stops us, so uh, you know it's like a cat chasing a tail. So we need to have social acceptance, so that when and if drones can come into larger areas, that there's not going to be a backlash, uh, that there's not going to be this negativity towards what we do. Um, so I would like to see this happening more in our community, um, and I hope to see. You know this but I would also like to talk about this as well so um, I'm sure my contact details are in there and anyone who wants to reach out you know on LinkedIn or whatever please get in touch uh, I'm happy to discuss this um, but thank you very much everyone it, it was a pleasure talking to you all uh, I hope to see you all uh, next year in person hopefully uh, thank you to Alexander for the invitation great to see everyone uh, in the uh, WABF here as well. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, and fly safe. And uh, now uh, uh, I have a big pleasure to uh, 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 say again, Thank you to all participants. Thank you to all speakers, to all those who all joined and uh, as a uh, as a um, uh, as a uh, uh, audience for our uh, to our our event. And uh, I have a pleasure now to uh, give a floor for the closing remarks to my uh, big friend and uh, uh, vice director uh, of the National Aviation University. Uh, Professor Harchenko. Professor Harchenko is the, uh, uh, responsible for research and development and scientific work here, and also he is the head of our navigation department of the uh, university. So, uh, Professor Harchenko, this floor is yours for the final remarks. Thank you. Uh, dear colleagues, our plenary session is coming to an end. I would like to express my uh, sincere gratitude to President of the ICAO Council, Mr. Shikotana, Commission, Mr. Hendrik Hololei, Director General of Eurocontrol, uh, Philip Merlo, and all the honorable members of Congress. I wish all participants professional success in the further development of safe, efficient, and environmentally friendly aviation. Only together we will be able to respond to all the um, challenges of its development. I want to express our wishes in the motto of our university, Vivere, Creare, Vincere. We wish you to live, to create, and to win. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. And now, now uh, uh, thank, thank you, everyone. everyone. And uh, again, uh, now we should say goodbye to you and disconnect our session. And I hope we will uh, continue in future. And uh, now, uh, those of you who are uh, participating in the particular scientific sections, uh, which will be held for another couple of days here in the university, we may join them. Uh, and uh, the plenary on this stage, our plenary session is closed and uh, we are really happy and delighted with such high level participation. So notwithstanding on where where in the or in this uh, in, the, in in the agenda you were you all all of you plus the most important uh, 
colleagues and, and, and partners. And we are looking forward to continue our cooperation. And thank you very much again. And thank you, technicians. Thank you, interpreters. Thank you, everyone who were around. You saw only us, but there are a team of technicians who uh, helped us. And uh, we should uh, be grateful to everyone. Thank you. And uh, now we close. Goodbye.